portfolio questions. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14833 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the timetable for the Crown Estate Bill at Stage 3. If anyone wishes to speak on this motion, please say so now. I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Thank you very Sorry. much. And no one's asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 14833 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, the next item is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at Stage 2, that is Scottish Parliamentary Bill 24A, the marshalled list and the grouping of amendments. And I would remind members, although many will be aware of this, the division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, there will, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press their request to speak button as soon as possible after I call the group. And we'll turn now to the marshalled list of amendments. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of John Scott, grouped with Amendments 2 and 4. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you for inviting me to speak to Amendments 1, 2 and 4 in my name. Amendment 2 would require the creation of a list of assets to be managed by Scottish Ministers or Crown Estate Scotland and would create a duty to consult individuals or bodies mentioned in 2A or B before making regulation regarding the transfer of assets. This amendment has been brought forward in response to evidence presented to the committee at stage one, when the committee came to the view that some assets should remain under national management at recommendation 16, and this was the view of Crown Estate Tenant Working Group, the NFUS and Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. It was also the view and evidence taken about the risk of fragmentation and the loss of critical mass of knowledge within the Crown Estates. And these amendments seek to respond to these concerns and maintain a critical mass of expertise within the Scottish Crown Estate. Amendment 4 would make Section 3.1a subject to the affirmative procedure, thereby ensuring a wide consultation process before making any transfer of assets. Amendment 1 is a technical amendment supporting Amendment 2. And there's no other members wish to speak. I call the Cabinet Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank uh, John Scott for lodging these amendments and for raising uh, the issue for debate. Um, the committee did express support for some activities to be managed at the national level. And Mr Scott has laid amendments which require regulations to be made which list assets to be managed at the national level, uh, either by the Scottish Ministers or Crown Estate Scotland. Um, the bill allows for management of assets to be devolved to public authorities and community groups that wish to take on this responsibility and who can demonstrate they have the requisite ability and experience to do so effectively. This allows decisions as to who will manage a particular Scottish Crown Estate asset to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. This is an approach that was supported by respondents to the Scottish Government's consultation on the long-term management of the Crown Estate in Scotland uh, the consultation took place in 2017. I believe that Mr Scott's amendments would undermine the case-by-case -case approach that the Scottish Government has advocated for the transfer or delegation of management of Scottish Crown Estate assets. As I outlined during the course of Stage 1, there may be circumstances where assets may need to be managed on a national basis and any proposed transfer of management will be subject to the Parliament's approval. The Scottish Government's response on this matter to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee Stage 1 report stated that we regard the question about which assets should be managed on a national basis and which can be devolved to a local level to be a strategic matter which could evolve over time. It would also be dependent on the level of interest expressed by persons wishing to actually manage an asset. I'm aware of the strong preference of the tenants for the rural estates to continue to be managed at the national level. And I'm also aware of the views that exist that some other assets need to be managed at the national level. I consider there to be valid arguments for some assets to be so managed, particularly at management of the rights in the 12 to 200 nautical mile zone and leasing for strategic national infrastructure, such as telecoms, cables, oil and gas pipelines and offshore wind leasing. 
I firmly believe that the case-by-case -case approach to reform of management provided for by the Bill can achieve the aim of ensuring that each asset is managed appropriately and at the appropriate level. And I therefore ask Mr Scott not to press his amendments. And I call on John Scott to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Well, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I very much appreciate um, the, the tone and the tenor of what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. And I hear exactly uh, what she does have to say. However, my view remains that it would provide clarity uh, for those considering taking on management of assets or not. If they, it was clearly defined uh, as to what are those assets that the government would consider um, allowing to be uh, taken on by others or not. Um, and indeed, the publication of, my, of a list would, would not preclude a case-by-case -case approach, which I understand uh, the value of and would support. I would, however, uh, press these amendments. Very good. As the member is pressing his amendments, uh, this question is the first... No, I'll first ask... It's the first question of the day. Hold on one second. I think I know the answer, but I have to ask first of all. Uh, do members... Um, sorry. Do members agree to Amendment 1? No. no. Therefore, this is, the first, um, this is the first vote of the day. Parliament will be suspended for five minutes while we ring the bell and call members to the chamber, at which point we will have a division. Thank you.
Thank you very much, colleagues. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. This will be a 30-second division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number one in the name of John Scott is yes, 28, no, 89. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment two in the name of John Scott, already debated with amendment one. John Scott, to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. We turn now to group two, which is a minor and technical group of amendments. I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with Amendments 20, 22 and 23. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 9 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group are all of a minor or technical nature. Amendment 9 simply corrects a reference to subsections plural in Section 3, Subsection 2, as the reference should be to a singular subsection. Amendment 20 amends Section 13 of the Bill so that it is clear that Scottish ministers cannot make directions about charges for the use of assets where the Crown Estate Transfer Scheme 2017 regulates the amount that can be charged in relation to agreements concerning the, uh, concerning the granting of rights in certain circumstances, for example, rights in tidal waters, pipelines and transmission or di uh, distribution of electricity. Amendment 22 will correct a typographical error in section 31 subsection 1 and Amendment 23 is a minor technical amendment to ensure that the definition of heritable security is introduced in a way that is consistent to the other definitions in the interpretation section of the Bill. I move Amendment 9. Thank you very much. And no member seems to wish to uh, speak in this group. Therefore, we move straight to the vote. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to Group 3 which is the transfer or delegation of management to harbour authorities or trust ports. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 10 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Government Amendments 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and 24 have been developed following careful consideration of the amendments lodged by Andy Whiteman at Stage 2 which sought to allow trust ports to be eligible to become a manager of Scottish Crown Estate assets. And I will also discuss Tavish Scott's amendments 25, 30, 32, 39 and 40. I accept the principle behind Mr. Whiteman's original and Mr. Scott's now wish to include trust ports and consider there to be merit in expressly allowing harbour authorities operating within Scotland to be eligible to seek and be given the right to manage Scottish Crown Estate assets. The foreshore and seabed around Scotland forms a significant part of the Crown Estate in Scotland and may include land within a designated harbour area uh, that a particular harbour authority resides, uh, operates in. Whilst the concept of a trust port is recognised within Scotland, it is in fact a, a type of body which is not actually defined in legislation. Each trust port is an independent statutory body which has a unique governance arrangement and is governed by its own legislation created by an Act of Parliament. Mr Scott's Amendment 40 would insert a particular definition of trust port in legislation, and the definition of trust port being used is defined as being a port, which is the physical structure of a harbour rather than a legal person. The definition also doesn't make any reference to the need of the trust port to have been given a statutory authority to maintain or manage a harbour. I therefore question whether the definition of trust port in Amendment 40 would work as intended. Moreover, trust ports are not the only models of harbour ownership in Scotland. Private ownership and local authority ports, along with trust ports, make up the three main models. I consider there to be merit in not just allowing trust ports to be eligible to become a Scottish Crown Estate Asset Manager, but also bodies which come under one of these other types of harbour ownership in Scotland, as all operate under similar legislative powers and duties. Amendments 10, 13 and 15 
have the effect of adding Scottish Harbour authorities as a category of eligible Scottish Crown Estate asset manager by way of both transfer and delegation. Amendment 14 provides that similar to a community organisation, Scottish ministers do not have the power to be able to direct a Scottish Harbour Authority who is already a manager to delegate to another manager. The definition of Scottish Harbour Authority set out in Amendment 16 and 24 uh, will allow trust ports such as Lowick Port Authority within Mr Scott's constituency and other Scottish Harbour Authorities like Tobermory Harbour Association to be eligible for a transfer or delegation of the management of a Scottish Crown Estate asset. Although, as far as I'm aware, there are no private ports in the Shetland Islands, there are private ports elsewhere, uh, some of them large, but also some small private ports, and it would be inequitable to restrict this provision to the pattern of port ownership in Shetland, however desirable Tavish Scott may feel uh, that that is. Whilst my amendments open up the possibility of other types of harbour authority becoming a Scottish Crown Estate asset manager and is not just restricted to trust ports, it remains the case that any regulations transferring management of the seabed will be subject to the affirmative procedure in this Parliament. The Scottish Parliament, therefore, has the final decision on such transfers of the seabed. In addition, the provisions in the bill which require separate accounting arrangements for Scottish Crown Estate assets from any other money that a manager may hold will provide adequate protection for the asset in such circumstances. Amendment 12 provides that the transfer regulations can make provisions in respect of what happens to the management functions and rights and liabilities in respect of an asset if a harbour authority ceased to exist or no longer had statutory powers to manage a harbour. The provisions are similar to those contained within the bill to deal with the situation where a community organisation ceases to exist. In most circumstances, the Scottish ministers will be aware in advance that a harbour authority is likely to cease to have the statutory power to manage a harbour as they would be involved in this legal process. But in the unlikely event that a private harbour authority uh, suddenly ceases to exist, this amendment has the effect of ensuring the continuing management of the Scottish Crown Estate asset. Although I've not yet heard his arguments, I would encourage Tavish Scott not to press his amendments. As explained, I believe the government amendments deliver the same objective as his amendments and indeed deliver more. I move Amendment 10. Thank you, and I call Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 25 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, entirely take the uh, Minister's uh, reasoned thinking on this matter? And also, I'm um, grateful to Andy Whiteman for his uh, previous work on the, on the issue of trust ports in, uh, in, in uh, committee. This is about uh, trust ports uh, having the, the management responsibility for seabed uh, in their area, which is a very important principle uh, of this uh, bill. It was a, a principle of the Smith Commission. A number of us in this place uh, worked on that some uh, years back in relation to island uh, authorities and island responsibilities. And it is also a recognition uh, that trust ports, as the Minister uh, alluded to, uh, invest all of their income in the facilities that they uh, therefore have uh, to uh, serve the clients of a port, in other words, the harbour users of an area. And that's why this uh, measure that uh, is being spoken to today, I believe, is an improvement in the bill. Uh, and uh, I, I take entirely the Minister's thinking uh, on the amendments the Government have moved uh, today. The final point, and the only other point I wish to make in, in this area is that uh, on Friday uh, Sandra Lawrence and the former chief executive indeed the first female chief executive of any port across the whole of the UK retired after 44 years of service uh, to uh, Lerwick and I would argue to, to uh, the port sector at large and for some of us these amendments today are very much in the honour of her great commitment to the to the uh, people who serve in ports the length and breadth of our country. I call two members have indicated the wish to speak the first is Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd just like to speak extremely briefly in support of the amendments and uh, recognise that um, the reasons for Tavish Scott um, uh, withdrawing his amendments. Um, and I would just like to seek um, some reassurance from the Cabinet Secretary that these um, uh, authorities and trusts are indeed constituted in the public interest, just for reassurance, as, as it is the devolution of the Crown Estate, which is in the public interest. And I also support the affirmative procedure arrangement. Thank you. I called. It would not be considered to be so. Thank you. I called John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the amendments in this group are in response to Andy Whiteman's amendments introduced at stage two and would further devolve responsibility from the Crown Estate to harbour authorities or trust ports, providing more local autonomy. 
As stage two government concerns centred around the control of ports and harbours in relation to local authorities, and we welcome the government's amendment brought forward in response to Andy Whiteman's probing amendments at stage two. And we welcome that these amendments that will be subject to the affirmative procedure. With regard to Tavish Scott's amendments to extend management functions to trust ports, we have concerns over whether or not individual harbours and ports should have control in this decision-making process and whether or not they should take on the management functions. And we note that the Cabinet Secretary still has concerns over Tavish Scott's amendments, um, and we share those concerns. So I'm not certain if Mr Scott said he would press or withdraw his amendments, but we will hear in due course, I dare say. Thank you very much. And the Cabinet Secretary may have already clarified an interjection, but does the Cabinet Secretary wish to wind up in this section? Um, no, other than to say that the only concern I have with Tavish Scott's amendment is it doesn't go as far as the government amendments, and I'm sure Tavish Scott would be happy to concede that. <laughs> Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. No. Oh, we're not agreed. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. We are not agreed. We'll move to a division. And this will be a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. Amendment 10. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 114. There were no votes against, four abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now I call amendment 25 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated, but Tavish Scott to move or not move? Not move, Zadigal. That's not moved. Thank you. We turn now to Group 4, which is the management of marine assets by local authorities. Can I call Amendment 11 in the name of Andy Whiteman, grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings. Andy Whiteman to move Amendment 11 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Smith Commission has already been mentioned, recommended in paragraph 33 of its final report, that following the devolution of the management of the Crown Estate, and I quote, responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas. Nowhere in this bill is that pledge fulfilled. As drafted, Section 3 gives authority to ministers to make regulations to transfer those management functions to any person mentioned in subsection 2. It remains possible that ministers may not choose to make regulations or may choose to revoke any regulations. In addition, it remains possible that regulations may be drafted in a way that makes the transfer of management functions unduly onerous on, or complex. The Smith Commission recommendation makes clear, however, that the responsibility will be further devolved. And at stage two, I lodged an amendment that would have given a statutory right to local authorities to manage the foreshore. I did not press it on the basis that I would have further discussions with the Cabinet Secretary. I had those discussions with her officials and herself, but got no response back, and so have lodged Amendment 11, which is less prescriptive than the one I lodged at stage two. Amendment 11 is designed to do little more than give a nod to the cross-party consensus of the Smith Commission by providing that Section 3 regulations enshrine a presumption in favour of transferring management of the foreshore to local authorities. The amendment relates only uh, to the foreshore because it is one of the distinctive ancient Crown property rights. Ownership by the Crown is regarded by the Law Commission, the Scottish Law Commission, as a patrimonial right derived from the Crown prerogative. It's nowhere defined in statute, but is, as the Commission notes, merely the predominant modern theory. It plays a distinct and critical role in coastal management, a function that more widely falls into the realm of local authorities. Its history, as set out in a recent book by John McCaskill, published by Edinburgh University Press, is one in which the public interest in the foreshore has frequently been compromised by uncertainty and legal dispute. 
Such disputes included through the 19th century uh, included disputes over the rights of crofters to gather kelp, a topic we'll be returning to today, a right which would by now have been enshrined in law had the recommendations of the Scottish Law Commission in 2003 to enact the Sea, Shore and Inland Water Scotland Act been implemented. 15 years later, it hasn't been. Such an act would have enshrined the statutory right to, amongst other things, make sandcastles, beachcomb, sunbathe and have picnics on the shore and foreshore. But I digress, perhaps. All the other amendments in this group are in the name of Liam MacArthur and seek to ensure that Section 3 regulations also make provision for the transfer of management of the seabed within the Scottish Marine region to any local authority that requests such a transfer. Again, these amendments fulfil the recommendations of the Smith Commission, recommendations that I recall were actually drafted by Tavish Scott, uh, who is a former chair and trustee of Lerwick Harbour Authority, knows a thing or two about the long and malign influence of the body corporate that is the Crown Estate Commissioners. We support all of Liam MacArthur's uh, amendments. Uh, I move Amendment 11. Thank you very much. And I call Lee MacArthur to speak to Amendment 26 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, President Officer. And uh, as Andy Whiteman says, this, uh, much of what we're talking about this afternoon will draw heavily on the recommendations of the Smith Commission. I would like to pay tribute to the efforts of my colleague Tavis Scott for ensuring uh, that the recommendations did indeed uh, fully address the uh, concerns around the Crown Estate. As I said at committee uh, at stage two, devolving management of Crown Estate in Scotland to the communities with most direct interest in and reliance on the future use of those assets, something I've been pursuing since before I was elected in 2007. So I welcome this bill and what it can help achieve, but like many believe it can and must go further, not least in unlocking and securing the benefits for communities uh, arising from developments in the marine environment uh, at this stage out to 12 nautical miles. It's not just about the re revenues though, uh, it's about how those assets are managed. My Amendment 26, much like Andy uh, Whiteman's, makes clear that relevant local authorities would have the right to request the transfer of responsibility for the management of any area of the seabed from the mean high water spring tides out to 12 nautical miles. The, the details of this process would be set out in regulation by ministers subject to review by Parliament and would give, give effect uh, to re Recommendation 32. Certainly will. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I think the member will uh, recall that I, I previously raised the issue of the sea between uh, Butte and Arran, where the distance between the two islands, which are in different local authorities, is less than 24 miles. And that, therefore, the way the amendments before us are constructed would make it impossible uh, for both councils to get out to 12 miles without overlap. I just wonder if the member has given further thought to how that particular issue, which is a special case, I accept, and doesn't attach to the generality of the argument, uh, how he thinks that would be dealt with. Lee MacArthur. I'd appreciate that and appreciate the fact that Stuart Stevenson did, as he said, uh, raise this at, at stage uh, two. This is not, I, I, I think, a unique uh, concern in relation to, to this specific uh, bill. I believe it could uh, be dealt with through the regulation uh, powers that uh, this amendment uh, puts in place. Um, but returning to um, the uh, Smith Committee uh, recommendations, uh, they did, as Andy Whiteman reminded us, call for the devolution of those uh, uh, assets to the Scottish Parliament, but went on to state, following the transfer, responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas such as Orkney, Shetland, Nihil and CR, and other areas who seek such responsibilities. Now, I know there will be some who argue that communities, and not just local authorities, should have the option of making these requests. This will be a point, I think, raised both in terms of my own amendments and Amendment 11 uh, previously referred to. I have some sympathy for that, but I'm sure that this, again, can be uh, addressed through subsequent re regulation. In any event, devolving management responsibility to local authorities does not preclude uh, and indeed should encourage local authorities to then further devolve that responsibility to local communities where appropriate. The other amendments are consequential on Amendment 26 with the exception of 41 and I know from speaking to colleagues in other parties over recent days that there are questions about limiting the application of the request power uh, to local authorities defined in the Islands Act. 
Uh, they, this may seem a little overzealous, though I believe that those listed in the Schedule to the Islands Act are most likely to have the opportunity, the appetite and indeed the experience to make best use of those powers. I recognise, though, that in the future perhaps other local authorities and communities may wish to take rec make requests to manage the marine assets off their shores, so I'll listen uh, to what other colleagues have to say before deciding uh, how to, uh, uh, whether or not to move Amendment 41, but I would move Amendment 26. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call John Scott to be followed by Claudia Beamish. John Scott. Yeah, well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, this group of amendments in the name of Leon MacArthur and Andy Whiteman seek to devolve the management of marine assets, including the foreshore and seabed, to local authorities where they request it. Stage two, the government expressed concerns that local authorities might always be best placed to manage the seabed and the foreshore, and this is a view that we share. In addition, the committee came to the view in the stage one report at recommendation 362 that the seabed is a national asset and should be managed nationally, and so we are unable to support this group of amendments. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish. Sorry, Sorry. and I call Sorry. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the presiding officer, and uh, we will be supporting the amendments in Group 4. Um, points have been made about the Smith Commission, so I won't uh, elaborate on that, but it is a very important aspect of the devolution that we recognise those commitments that were made at that time um, in, in a cross-party way. Um, and I wonder if Andy Whiteman, uh, in summing up, might um, highlight something about the, um, the presumption in favour of local authorities, which he's highlighted in his um, amendment um, 11, that in his view that that would not preclude going further to community groups, and Liam MacArthur has also um, highlighted that, that point. Um, I, I also just want to highlight some concerns um, that we have on these benches about the, um, uh, the points that John Scott was making, although we will, we will support the amendments and those are particularly in relation to um, the capacity of local authorities with training and uh, and the capacity to monitor um, uh, uh, seabed issues um, particularly in the the face of council cuts um, uh, i think the issue around other local authorities is a, a, a complex one um, it, it within the smith commission has, has already been highlighted it is the um, island community, the island local authorities to which that, um, uh, this, these amendments should refer, uh, and we're minded to leave it, leave it in that way at the moment. But if in the future, um, as um, I think Liam MacArthur made the point, other local authorities had an interest, it might be that um, regulations might have to be uh, considered or reconsidered. Thank you. Thank you, I call the Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the government will not be supporting these amendments. They cut across the policy of giving community organisations the opportunity to take on the management of a Scottish Crown estate asset, including the foreshore. Amendment 26 would place a duty on Scottish ministers to make regulations to transfer to a relevant local authority, and that's in inverted commas, that requests it the right to manage an area of the seabed, including the foreshore. It could therefore prevent a community organisation from taking on directly the management of a Crown Estate asset. As yet, although no community organisations from Orkney and Shetland have so far expressed interest in the local asset management pilots, there is interest from community organisations in the Western Isles, Argyll and Butte, Highland Council and Clyde area. I recognise that Mr Whiteman seeks only to create a presumption in favour of local authorities by Amendment 11. Nonetheless, I'm of the view that there should be as much of a presumption in favour of community organisations managing Scottish Crown Estate assets. The bill doesn't contain any presumptions over who should manage any particular Scottish Crown Estate asset. And that is as I believe it should be, as it allows for consideration on a case-by-case -case basis and allows those who wish to manage an asset to demonstrate why they are best placed to do so. Amendment 26 seeks to require ministers to transfer the right to manage the seabed out to 12 nautical miles if any of the following local authorities request that. Argyll and Butte Council, Western Isles, Highland Council, North Ayrshire Council, Orkney Council and Shetland Council. There are technical issues with this amendment, including its reference to an area of seabed within its relevant Scottish marine region. While the reference to the Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 may work for the Northern and Western Isles, 
it is less useful for the other islands councils where the marine regions do not directly correspond to local authority boundaries. For example, there are three Scottish marine regions which include parts of the marine area adjacent to Highland Council and one of these, the Murray Firth Scottish Marine Region, also includes the marine area adjacent to Murray Council. Also, the Clyde Marine Region includes part of the marine area adjacent to Isle Argyll and Butte Council and also includes part of the marine area adjacent to North Ayrshire Council as well as the marine areas adjacent to other councils, including Inverclyde and South Ayrshire. There is also no parliamentary procedure specified for these regulations. While the bill requires regulations under section 3.1 to be subject to the affirmative procedure, if they relate to an asset, all or part of which is situated in or relates to the Scottish marine area or the Scottish zone, that provision would not apply to regulations under new subsection 3.2a which would be inserted by Amendment 26. It is also unclear what is meant uh, by the transfer of the right to manage the seabed rather than transfer of the function of managing it. Amendment 31 is similar to Amendment 26, but requires ministers to direct Crown Estate Scotland to transfer part of the seabed out to the 12 nautical mile limit to a local authority if the local authority so requests. And this amendment refers to the transfer of an asset rather than to delegation of the management of an asset, which is what section four of the bill is about. But I think the intention is to require delegation of the management function rather than transfer of ownership. This also therefore creates a similar problem to amendment 26 in terms of cutting across ambitions of community organizations to become a manager of a Scottish Crown Estate asset. I would expect that local authorities would seek a transfer of management under section three of the bill and it would be more likely that under section four, ministers would use this power to direct a local authority to delegate the management of an area of foreshore managed by them to a community organization. However, it is also possible that a community organization would like the management of an asset to be delegated to them directly by Crown Estate Scotland. Mr. MacArthur's amendment 33 appears to be intended to prevent that. I cannot understand why community organisations should not have the ability to have delegated to them management of an area of the immediate foreshore they have a particular interest in managing. Perhaps it would be helpful to explain the effect of section 4.2. Section 4.2a covers the rather obvious point that ministers cannot direct themselves to do anything. The assumption underlying section 4.2b is that a community organisation is managing its local asset so it is unlikely that it would seek to delegate that management to another person. To do so would be giving away the community's control over decision making. If it does not want to continue the management of the asset, then it can then ask ministers to transfer the management to another manager, be that a local authority, Crown Estate Scotland, or another Scottish public authority. We would not want to preclude community organisations from managing local Scottish Crown Estate assets, whether under transfer or delegation, and for that reason, I cannot support Andy Whiteman's Amendment 11, nor Liam MacArthur's Amendments 26 to 31, 33 to 38, and 41. And moreover, there are some serious technical deficiencies with Liam MacArthur's Amendments, uh, as I've outlined, rendering them unworkable. So I would urge Mr. Whiteman and Mr. MacArthur not to press their amendments. Thank you very much. And I call Andy Whiteman to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 11. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, in response to Claudia Beamish, no, it won't preclude uh, transfers to others. These, these amendments, I can't speak for Liam MacArthur, but certainly my own ones, are designed to uphold the fundamental principles that was agreed by the Conservatives, by the SNP, by Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish Greens in the Smith uh, Commission. I reject the notion that it cuts across uh, community bodies. We don't believe that Scottish ministers in any event should be the final arbiter of that anyway. And underpinning my amendment is the notion that it's the place of local government to be making these decisions, not Scottish ministers. Furthermore, uh, these amendments are only concerned with regulations, in particular number 11, stipulating that regulations should only provide for a presumption. Regulations are well capable of incorporating such uh, a provision. Uh, Liam MacArthur's amendments 
Uh, again, place clear duties to be implemented by regulations, again providing plenty of flexibility to frame the duty in the most appropriate uh, manner. I, I note the government's not supporting these amendments and not, neither the Conservatives, so I won't uh, detain members any, any further. But I should say I'm disappointed in the government's response to this. I think it is a betrayal of a clear commitment made by the uh, Smith Commission and I'm further disappointed that we weren't able to uh, reach an agreement on the principles uh, behind the amendment that I lodged at stage two. I press amendment 11. Thank you very much. And the question is that, that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We're going to move to a division. This will be a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 33, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 26 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with amendment 11. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. This will be a 30 second vote. The result of the vote on amendment number 26 in the name of Lee MacArthur is yes, 33, no, 85. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 12 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with amendment 10. Cabinet Secretary to move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 27 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated with amendment 11. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. It's not moved. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 11. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 10. Cabinet Secretary to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. I call Amendment 30 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 10. Tavish Scott to move or not move? That is not moved. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Liam MacArthur. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated. Cabinet Secretary to moved. move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Not That's moved. not moved. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not That's moved. not moved. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Lee MacArthur. To move or not moved? Not moved. That's not moved. That's good can I call amendments 36 to 38 in the name of Lee MacArthur? Lee, Mr MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. 
36, 37 or 38. I call Amendment 15 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated. Thank you. Moved by the Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. I call Amendment 5, Sorry. I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary moved. to move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 40 in the name of Tavish Scott. Tavish Scott to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Lee MacArthur. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That is not moved. Thank you. We turn now to Group 5, which is the duty to maintain and enhance value. I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 18. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 17 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 17 has been developed in response to a debate at Stage 2 on the amendments lodged by both myself and by Mark Ruskell in respect of the duties on any manager on how it should manage a Scottish Crown Estate asset. And I want to put on record my thanks both to Mark Ruskell and Claudia Beamish for the constructive conversations we've had between Stage 2 and today on this particular issue. Um, Amendment 17 places an obligation on managers that in maintaining and seeking to enhance the value and return of Scottish Crown Estate assets, they must act in the way best calculated to further the achievement of sustainable development in Scotland and must seek to manage the assets in a way that is likely to contribute to the promotion and improvement of the wider socio-economic and environmental factors listed. Amendment 18 is consequential on Amendment 17. It deletes sustainable development from the list of socio-economic and environmental factors in subsection 7.2b as the duty to manage an asset in a way that contributes towards sustainable development will feature on its own within section 7.2a if Amendment 17 is agreed. I recognise the concerns expressed about section 7.2 of the bill as introduced and that's why I lodged an amendment at stage 2. That amendment was not accepted, although I undertook to discuss the issues further with interested members. It is as a result of these discussions that I lodged these amendments. They retain the overarching commercial duty, but give greater prominence to sustainable development. I've listened to the concerns of members about the need to strengthen the duty and to the other concerns expressed about the need to maintain the revenue and capital value of the estate. The solution I've proposed seeks to maintain the value and income from Scottish Crown Estate assets whilst requiring managers to act in a way that they think is most likely to further sustainable development and also to strengthen the requirement on managers to actively try to achieve the wider socio-economic and environmental factors in carrying out that management. I move Amendment 17. Thank you very much. And there are two members who wish to speak. I call John Scott to be followed by Claudia Beamish. <laughs> oh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And Amendment 17 is already discussed by the Cabinet Secretary is the may versus must argument. As Scottish Conservatives, we believe that this section 711 in the bill as introduced at stage two was perfectly adequate and left discretion with Crown Estate managers as to whether or not they needed to consider economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development. And this presumably was the view of the Cabinet Secretary at the time the bill was introduced. However, following the stage one report, the government introduced an amendment in response to the majority view of the committee that Crown Estate must, perhaps, consider the above list, which some colleagues thought did not go far enough. My colleague, Claudia Beamish, while we on these benches thought that the amendment went too far. And so the status quo on the bill as introduced remained in place. Today, the government has reintroduced must back into the remit of a manager at Amendment 21, and that managers must now once again seek to further sustainable development as well as deliver economic development, regeneration, social well-being and environmental well-being. However, while we support the aspiration to do all of these tasks, we remain to be convinced that this is an improvement on the bill as introduced. So we will not be supporting Amendment 17 and 18. Thank you, and I call Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And uh, uh, this is an important aspect of the devolution of managerial responsibilities. And uh, sustainable development should um, have the must rather than the may. And so I am delighted that the cabinet secretary 
agrees um, with this position and I thank her for discussions after stage two on Mark Ruskell's amendment, um, uh, which was supported by uh, my colleague Alex Rowley and I in, in, um, in committee. I do think that it is important also to highlight that economic development, regeneration, social well-being and environmental well-being are lists that are of fundamental importance in taking forward the future of um, the people of Scotland and therefore um, we are very supportive of, the, of uh, the two amendments today. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up in this question. Um, thank you. I don't wish to say too much extra other than to perhaps point out to those such as uh, John Scott who uh, aren't happy about the idea that sustainable development should be one of the things that uh, is taken on board, that in actual fact there are at least three other mentions in other uh, pieces of legislation where sustainable development or similar functions would actually uh, already be part of uh, a manager's duty. Yes, of course. Oh, Scott. For taking an intervention. The sustainable development is very much part of the bill as introduced, and we are happy to support that position for the avoidance of doubt and misunderstandings. Cabinet Secretary. You know, I think the argument then is about may and must, which of course is an argument that's probably been had in this chamber in many occasions, uh, in many different sections of the bill. Uh, and we wanted simply to place, uh, place it beyond doubt that it is something that must be considered rather than perhaps be regarded as an optional extra, uh, um, uh, which was uh, perhaps a suggestion that that might be the case. And, and the, the, what I was trying to point out was that uh, Crown estate managers are under obligations that derive from other pieces of legislation as well. Uh, and what we want to do with this particular piece of legislation is make sure it's very clear on the face of this bill that it does apply. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. This will be a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 17 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 89. There were no votes against, 28 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. Now I call amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated. Cabinet Secretary to move. Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division. This will be a 30 second division. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on Amendment 18 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 88, no, 1, abstain, 27. The amendment is therefore agreed. I'm going to turn now to Group 6, and this is on the harvesting of sea kelp. Can I call Amendment 6 in the name of Mark Ruskell, grouped with Amendments 7, 8, 19, 21A and 21B, Mark Ruskell to move Amendment 6 and to speak to all amendments in the group. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group deal with both a threat and an opportunity. The threat is to our last great wilderness in Scotland, the ancient kelp forests, hidden rich nurseries of nature and commercial fish, vast stores of carbon larger than our rainforests, defenders of our coastlines against the storms to come. The threat comes not from the harvesting of kelp per se, but from harvesting of kelp in a way that prevents it from regrowing. We know that if kelp is removed in its entirety from the seabed, then it may never grow back, and once it's gone, its benefits may be lost forever. The opportunity, however, is to recognize that kelp, if harvested and farmed sensitively, is a wonderful material for food and industrial purposes that can support livelihoods in remote communities. It is then the job of government to set the bar high for the public interest, but allow industry to innovate and respond within the environmental limits. So my amendment 21A and B seeks to insert a golden rule into the licensing framework spelled out by the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 21. The golden rule simply being that kelp must be harvested in a way that doesn't prohibit the regrowth of the plants. Now this golden rule is well established and the wording is reflected in the existing licenses for those already harvesting kelp using non-industrial methods. And this amendment is worded carefully to ensure it only covers situation, situations where the kelp material removed is being used for commercial purposes. Where kelp is removed and discarded, as is the case with clearing navigation channels and harbors or other infrastructure such as nuclear power plant cooling systems, this amendment would not apply. In relation to amendments 6, 7 and 8, uh, these are Latin corrections, uh, embarrassing for somebody who has a biology degree, but I'll blame Microsoft spell checker, presiding officer. <laughs> Um, I will not be moving them, as the Cabinet Secretary has corrected my Latin homework in her Amendment 21. We'll also be supporting Amendment 19, which removes my Golden Rule Amendment from Stage 2, but allows it to be reinserted again via Amendments 21A and B, which I now move, Presiding Officer, in my name, but with the valued support of my colleague, Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much. And I call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 19 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we all want to protect kelp as an important feature of our marine biodiversity. And because of the habitat it provides for other species, including fish, playing a key role in coastal and climate protection. And I've listened to views on this important but complex issue, and I've decided to lodge amendments at Stage 3 to remove and replace Section 8A, because the section on kelp that was inserted at Stage 2 would not achieve what was intended and could have had serious unintended consequences. The test to be met in Section 8A of not inhibiting the regrowth of an individual plant when combined with an absolute prevention on harvesting that inhibits regrowth could in fact prevent the very scientific research we need to better understand the recovery rate of these species in various conditions in Scottish waters. Section 8A would also have prevented non-commercial but essential maintenance work for safety reasons such as removing seaweed around cooling systems in power stations or from navigation channels in ports. For example, a marine license was issued to EDF Energy, operator of Hunterston B Power Station, in August 2017 for the removal of 150 tonnes of various species of seaweed in an area local to the Hunterston cooling water uh, intake. Nor can I guarantee that Section 8A will have no impact on existing sustainable seaweed harvesting and the associated income and employment that our rural areas depend on. And for all of the reasons I've outlined, and particularly because Section 8A would clearly prevent activity of public interest, such as scientific research, that is needed to improve our scientific knowledge of kelp, kelp habitats and their rate of recovery, I, I don't support Section uh, 8A. Uh, and that's existing Section 8A. For these reasons, Section 8A cannot be left in the bill at this important and final stage of the bill's progress through this parliament. Um, if I return turn now to Amendment 21, I remain of the view that the Scottish Crown Estate Bill is not the optimal place to control seaweed harvesting. Uh, however, Mark Ruskell's amendments have surfaced a range of issues regarding the regulation of current and proposed harvesting activity in this emerging sector. The issues are complex, uh, many and varied, and require the gathering of further evidence. Andy Wyman. I thank the Minister for taking intervention. Uh, does she accept, however, that the report of the Law Commission in 2003 that proposed a, quite a considerable modernisation of the law of the foreshore 
and the seabed. It included, for example, provisions around kelp and crofters' right to gather kelp. Would have been a better place to put this, and would you consider introducing such a, a bill this session? Well, I, I'm not Have going to be uh, drawn on uh, increasing the legislative uh, uh, programme uh, in this particular parliamentary session. Um, I'm happy to talk to Andrew Whiteman and anybody else who has uh, any further bright ideas, but uh, uh, I think uh, I would rather focus simply on where we are at the moment. Uh, and we're having this debate in the context of the Crown Estate Bill, uh, and uh, uh, there are some issues that uh, because we're having the debate in the context of this bill, there are some issues that need to be uh, put uh, uh, before the Chamber. Um, uh, we need to ensure that existing activity and future proposals are sustainable. But I've listened to all the views expressed. Amendment 21 would put on a statutory footing that a Scottish Crown Estate Manager cannot grant a right to remove wild kelp if the removal is a marine licensable activity and no marine license has been obtained. And this would apply to all managers and would therefore future-proof current good practice that is not, as we speak, a requirement in legislation. This amendment also makes clear that granting such a right is void if a marine license is required and the marine license has not been given. In addition, this amendment would meet the important test of ensuring that we can still undertake scientific research to enhance our knowledge of kelp which would be put at risk by Section 8A, as introduced at Stage 2 of the Bill. Mark Ruskell has lodged Amendment 21A to my Amendment 21, which reintroduces the key provisions from his original amendment, prohibiting the removal of certain species of wild kelp, where removal inhibits the regrowth of an individual plant. And a critical difference is that it is now limited to commercial use only. As I've already mentioned, this bill is not the best place for a control of this type. For example, it only applies to a manager of the Scottish Crown Estate, and only half of the foreshore is part of the Scottish Crown Estate, so it would not deliver the protection sought in all parts of Scotland where the species are found. There is also a risk that Mark Ruskell's amendment could cut across the marine licensing system that Parliament voted for and which is contained in the Marine Scotland Act 2010. However, I'm also very aware of concerns that have been expressed in this debate over the past weeks. I've listened carefully to those concerns and Having considered them at length, I'm willing to provide my support to this amendment. I do have concerns about the lack of definition provided in the amendment as to the meaning of the terms commercial use and removal. And therefore, I do want to make clear that I do support this amendment on the basis that what is not being sought is to prevent scientific research from continuing to improve our scientific understanding of kelp, kelp habitats and recovery potential or appropriate research and development for public health purposes such as pharmaceuticals, to, it, that it will not be preventing power stations, and I think perhaps Mark Ruskell's already uh, alluded to this, prevent power stations, commercial ports, or other similar public infrastructure from removing kelp species for maintenance purposes or other public interest reasons, and would not prevent hand cutting above the base of the meristem where growth occurs, or prevent harvesting via hand cutting which Scottish natural heritage have advised as sustainable. And I think it's important that I make those assertions uh, on the floor of the chamber. I'm confident that those who have proposed Amendment 21A would agree that there is no intention for the amendment to cut across the points I've just outlined. And I'm highlighting these points just to ensure and invite them to confirm that this is the case for the sake of clarity as to what the chamber's intentions are in voting on this amendment. I cannot guarantee that Amendment 20A will have none of these un unintended impacts or that it will have no impact on existing sustainable seaweed harvesting. But I would obviously have to consider the need to legislate further if some of those specific issues did arise. I will also consider the need for guidance or directions to managers on these issues if these amendments are passed. Furthermore, I would plan to keep the situation under review and would not wish unreasonably to block the future development of forms of harvesting which we might in time establish through a proper assembling of the evidence as sustainable. For the time being, given the increasing profile of kelp harvesting as an activity, and in view of the need to further our understanding of kelp species, kelp habitats, and kelp recovery potential, it is also my intention to keep these matters under review. I'm therefore announcing to Parliament today a review of the regulatory regime of all kelp harvesting activity. And members in the chamber may be interested to know that currently there are five different ways in which uh, kelp can be harvested uh, commercially that it isn't simply hand versus uh, mechanical. And I think all of those particular ways of doing that should be uh, part of this review. That will therefore include harvesting that is not currently a licensable activity, 
which I'm advised is deemed to be sustainable, but where it seems proportionate and appropriate to examine whether it should be included within an expanded licensing regime. I'm confident that the licensing process is robust, thorough, and does what it's supposed to do effectively. I'm also very conscious of the need for continuous improvement in how we regulate activities in our marine environment, particularly where there is interest in undertaking new or novel activities. I'm therefore giving a commitment to Parliament today that Marine Scotland will undertake a strategic programme of work to undertake a review of the regulatory regime for all kelp harvesting activity in Scotland. This will recognise the need to understand and take fully into account in licensing decisions the environmental implications of the removal of kelp from the marine environment by any method, develop locational guidance for potential kelp resources areas, and outline the research and evidence-based requirements so that we are better informed on the environmental impacts of developing a kelp industry. And this will enable us to make informed decisions on sustainable development of the seaweed sector. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for giving way and the commitment to the review. Could she also confirm that there will be independent scientific advice brought into this, particularly from seaweed academic specialists who understand this area? I'll, Cabinet I'll, Secretary. I'm going to be expanding on that. The work that I'm talking about will involve consideration of the need for a pilot project uh, at an appropriate scale, design and location to collect evidence of the potential environmental impacts of seaweed harvesting and regeneration potential. And I've instructed officials to form a steering group for this strategic programme of work with representatives from key environmental agencies, NGOs and sectoral stakeholders, which will firstly establish the timetable for the work programme in the coming months, including arrangements for reporting progress before ultimately overseeing delivery of this work programme. I want to make it clear that this review is not being undertaken because of any deficiency identified in the marine license system. In fact, the system, in my view, is robust and is being shown to work, but I'm conscious that there is current interest, and there may be more interest in future, in new types of seaweed harvesting in Scottish waters. This review seeks to promote a spirit of continuous improvement and to ensure that we are pushing at the limits of having the very best regime possible. So I hope I've outlined a proportionate way forward given the current evidence base uh, and complexities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I uh, call this number of five members wish to speak in this section of the debate. I call John Scott to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, and this uh, group of amendments around the harvesting of sea kelp is the only really contentious part of this bill. And the Cabinet Secretary has just outlined why. In fact, I, I welcome her announcement. Um, but Amendment 42 was lodged by Mark Ruskell at the Stage 2 process and accepted for consideration was a surprise as it was widely accepted that this matter is a licensing issue and should not have been part of the bill. However, the Green Amendment became part of the bill as amended at Stage 2 and today we welcome the Government Amendment 19 which leaves out Section 8A and there the matter should have rested and the proposal for kelp harvesting from MBL should have been dealt with in the normal, well-defined licensing and regulatory way. However, the government have acknowledged, and we too acknowledged, that there are valid concerns to be addressed about this harvesting of Laminaria hyperborea, hyperborea and these have to be dealt with. Uh, that these concerns have de developed, notwithstanding what the Cabinet Secretary has just said, suggest that the public have no faith in our licensing system or our regulatory bodies and developmental agencies such as Marine Scotland and the Scottish Enterprise and other investment agencies whose advice and help MBL have sought and relied upon in developing this harvesting process as well as the development of a range of groundbreaking medically significant products. That these well articulated public concerns are what is now driving this debate and support for Mark Ruskell's amendment leaves me too wondering if the whole developmental process is indeed fit for purpose because despite MBL proposals having passed through every regulatory hoop for the last eight years, we've reached a position today where we and Parliament will accept Mark Ruskell's Amendment 21A because we accept the concerns expressed by Mark Ruskell and others may be valid. However, if companies such as MBL are not to be forever deterred from carrying out research and development work with a view to bringing new products to market, I'd rather not, if you forgive me, I'd rather not, um, derived from natural resources, this whole regulatory and developmental system has to be changed, perhaps radically, 
or would-be investors and innovators will never again look to Scotland as a place to do business. And therefore, in that regard, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's uh, announcement today of essentially a root and branch review into this whole matter, um, which, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, is perhaps long overdue. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Gail Ross. Right. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I would like to speak in support of Rosanna um, Cunningham, and the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 21 today. And I think this is a, a helpful um, amendment and um, in terms of, as, as it has been said, future-proofing um, good practice. So I, I particularly welcome the review of the regulatory re regime. Um, and the issues that she's highlighted that will be looked into on a scientific basis. Um, this is very important for the future sustainable development of our, of our shores. Um, the Crown Estate Bill, of course, devolves management of the assets, and these are owned um, by the Crown in the public interest. The seabed forms part of these assets. Thus, in my view, this is owned by the people of Scotland and is a public good that must be managed in all our interests. This means sustainable development that must be at the core of all decision-making by managers. Uh, the amendment by Mark Ruskell, supported by myself, at stage three, um, has been highlighted as one which, by which the uh, Scottish Crown Estate must not grant the right of harvesting wild kelp from any area of the seabed under their management where such harvesting would inhibit the regrowth of the individual plant. This is fundamental to sustainable development. As such, it is, as it is stated robustly as part of the framework of the future kelp harvesting in our inshore waters. And it is particularly important in view of the review that the Cabinet Secretary has announced today of seaweed licen licensing more broadly. Why? Because kelp forests are protected as, marine, uh, as priority marine features and because of blue carbon issues, which I have worked with um, over a number of years, uh, not least with um, the now Energy Minister, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, uh, to get these into um, the climate change plan, and this is very important in relation to our future emissions. The National Marine Plan details the issue of climate change and Scottish Environment Link stresses in its submission to our Committee on the Climate Change Bill that it is essential, I quote, that Scotland seeks to reduce pressure on carbon sinks and considers opportunities to enhance blue har carbon habitats. And, and then I would add, not diminish them. We must not take this risk. So ecosystem protection, coastal erosion, the, the protection of juvenile fish, the protection of seabirds uh, who feed on sand eels, uh, which I've seen for myself on the North Harris Trail this summer, uh, and are a protected species, are absolutely fundamental. Um, and any future harvesting of the range of kelps in a devolved uh, arrangement should continue to be sustainable, as is at present the case. I now turn very briefly to community and industry concerns and the support of the regrowth of kelp amendment. There have been a wide range of submissions after stage two, I acknowledge, uh, to the Eclair Committee expressing cogent and clear reasons why uh, this amendment is, is valid and should go forward uh, today. Some are scientific and well referenced. Others are about the right to our kelp forests as a public good. The submissions include fishermen's uh, organisations such as the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Association with 400 members, hand divers for scallops, trawlermen, uh, not always um, in harmony, these groups. However, on this, indeed, which is a good step, it is, and hand gatherers of kelp for artisan use, uh, marine tourism companies, and some community councils. And I welcome many of these, along with some primary school children today, into the public gallery to hear um, how this progresses. I, I would also point out that there is research work and now some limited uh, farming of seaweed in Scottish waters. Uh, and that this, as I understand it, um, and I think the Cabinet Secretary confirmed it would not be affected, um, and this is a, a, a welcome, um, welcome statement. At stage two, I, I stress that while supporting the amendment, that this is about the future protection and sustainable harvesting arrangements for Scotland. It is not about any individual application. 
If this was a land issue, there would be no question of not upholding the principle of sustainable harvesting, and there must not be in our inshore waters. While planted forests are harvested on land, native forests and woodlands and forests are not, with the exception of coppicing, which allows regrowth on a limited scale. In the view of Scottish Labour, this is a sea justice issue parallel to a land justice issue. And I add our support to these amendments. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Joanne Lamond. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to begin by thanking and acknowledging the huge contribution made by <clears throat> the people, some of uh, whom are with us today in the public gallery. Um, Noel, Janice and the Ullipil Sea Savers, Finn, Maya, Alicia, Kaylin and Poppy, and also those who can't be with us today, the Sunnyside Ocean Defenders, and all those individuals and businesses that got in touch, signed open letters, petitions, and especially to Ailsa McClellan, whose tireless campaigning has been nothing short of inspirational. <laughs> the position outlined by the Cabinet Secretary is one I very much welcome. I also thank Mark Ruskell and Claudia Beamish and Finlay Carson for the way in which they have looked to work on a cross-party basis to deliver this result. In supporting these amendments on the restriction on removal of wild kelp from the seabed, we not only ensure the sustainability of the marine environment, but also the sustainability of the local hand harvesters who do so much to manage the kelp supply. But this is not to suggest that we want to restrict economic or research activity, far from it. The proposed regulatory regime outlined by the Cabinet Secretary gives us the opportunity to ensure we protect our marine environment and encourage sustainable business, along with the wide range of research opportunities open to us. I also welcome the review announced by the Cabinet Secretary, and this will give us all a chance to hear and put on record the necessary evidence to ensure going forward we can achieve the aims we outline here today. Presiding officer, some people in industry have been quoted recently as saying that this gives out the wrong message economically. I don't agree. I would say it sends out the correct message environmentally. Thank you. Thank you. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I both declare an interest and note that I have less expertise than probably everybody else that's spoken in this regard thus far. The interest I declare is that my forebears would have harvested kelp. They when cleared off the land, relied on the sea for some kind of sustenance. My forebears too had to leave the land and where they, they wanted to stay as part of the significant migration out of the highlands and islands into our cities simply because there was not work for them to do. And I think we need to see this debate on kelp and the interest it's generated in that context, not something obscure that's happening somewhere else, but something that happened generations ago where there was a failure to create economic opportunities for our communities. Now, I have welcomed, if, uh, let me make some progress, I've welcomed the willingness over time of governments of all stripe to seek economic opportunities to sustain fragile and remote communities and rural ones. A willingness to harvest the energy of the wind and the sea in the interests of the people of those communities. And I think we need to see this issue in that context as well. There has to be environmental protections, but it is right that we should be willing to look at the economic, social uh, impact as well as the environmental impact. I note what the, the Cabinet Secretary has said, and I welcomed her reassurance that she sees this in the context um, of protection, not just the environment, but the economy of local communities. I would ask her if she is coming back in again to make a further commitment to economic regeneration in these times for these communities. And I also wonder, um, when we talk about the commercial interest, and perhaps in summing up, Mark Russell can address this question. Is all commercial interest bad? If it were a community enterprise, a cooperative enterprise, it still has to be commercially viable. And I think we should be looking for commercial opportunities for people in these communities with the protections that have been identified. And I would seek reassurance from the mover of, of the amendment that he is not suggesting that kelp, where it may be a commercial interest to do so, should, not, um, should be ruled out. 
I think he, I'm sure we are all committed to understanding the protections of our environment. But we also have a duty in terms of social economic impact of communities to look at proposals. And my final point, and again I reflect on what the Cabinet Secretary has said, some of the conversation around this, I think the language itself has created a reaction. To say that something is an industrial approach is, is a pejorative term in my view. I think it has to be an economic approach that secures the environment but creates jobs for people who want to stay in those communities. There needs to be protections, but we should be seeing it in the context of communities which have the right to say we want economic opportunities within our communities as well as elsewhere. And so in conclusion, and it was important because we have been lobbied on this to recognise that people who may want to see kelp being taken from the seas do so as a desire to create economic opportunity, to develop our scientific understanding of the environment. And I, my final point would be to be reassured that we are not simply putting science to one side in these regards. John Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. Will the member accept that proponents of the, the, this amendment do not want to see an end to kelp harvesting. We want to see sustainable kelp harvesting, which is a different thing. Joanne Lamond. Well, of course, sustainable and commercial seem to be applied as contradictions to each other. They are not. They are not contradictions to each other. Perhaps we need to have a conversation about what sustainable is and have a, a mature conversation across all of us about what we are prepared to see being developed in our remote and rural communities, because there will always be a trade-off. I want my nephews to have the opportunity to live within the communities in which they were born, in jobs that will keep them sustained and keep these communities viable and alive. I don't think there is a contradiction between these two. I don't even think the people in this chamber are in contradiction one with another. But I do, again, hope, as I think the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, an importance of science and evidence being used and not the suggestion that simply because something is a commercial opportunity, that is a problem for communities. I, as somebody who promotes, um, supports cooperative initiatives, I know how they have to be commercially viable and how successful they can be in sustaining the communities that we all care about. I call Stuart Stevenson and then the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, I'm as big a fan of kelp as anyone else, including uh, Mark uh, Ruskell, and I share all the ob environmental observations that have been made. They have considerable uh, merit. Now, that's what I actually said at stage two uh, when the amendment that brought uh, Section 8 Alpha into uh, the bill uh, was brought forward. Now, that was an amendment which was passed by the committee with three votes only in favour and six votes who abstained. And why, why did that abstention take place? Not because we thought that kelp was not worthy of protection. We do. I think everyone thought that and continues to think that. But because the process causes us considerable difficulties. And indeed, Mark Rusko, in an intervention in this brief debate, uh, presiding officer, said, we now need independent scientific advice. Well, that's a fascinating way to legislate. We pass the law first, and then we go into looking at the independent scientific advice. It's just simply doing things, and I'm not allowed to use the colloquial, uh, back to front. Uh, so, presiding officer, I speak to the process, not to the substance, uh, which I'm slightly reluctantly being persuaded uh, I should vote for because that's the best way of protecting kelp uh, which we all want to do. Now kelp is a valuable harvest when Lord Leverhulme opened uh, a herring and kelp harvesting uh, farm at Northton in Harris a hundred years ago or thereabouts. Uh, that was an indication uh, of the, the value there is. I just want, to, since so much has been said, presiding officer, to, to, to bring my remarks to a conclusion by making perhaps unusually a plea to yourself, presiding officer. Uh, one of your colleagues uh, chairs the uh, uh, conveners committee in this parliament. Um, what has happened here has all the marks of what happens in the South African legislature and the United States legislature as what is called earmarking. In other words, introducing something which was not part of the bill at stage one when we passed 
the general principles of the bill, and this is outside that altogether, using an instrument perhaps within the rules of the parliament to absolutely accept. But I think it may be useful for guidance to be given to committee conveners as to the admissibility of, uh, of amendments that they may select, because it is their choice. I will. If Andy Whiteman. Uh, th this, uh, these amendments were deemed both competent Absolutely. and uh, uh, within scope. Uh, and remind the, men, the, the member that this is an act of the Scottish Parliament to make provision about the management of the Crown Estate, amongst other things. Uh, these kelp species are, are part of the land on which they grow by law. They're the property of the Crown. And these amendments are designed to govern the management of a very critical part of the Crown Estate. They're wholly within the scope of this bill. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to engage with that directly because, because Andy Whiteman is correct. The perfectly valid amendments to bring forward to the bill. I'm simply saying that in an environment where the committee has not received and taken and challenged a single piece of evidence on this subject and where we even have the mover of an amendment here saying we now need independent scientific advice, I think there is a wider issue about how we take these things Yes, I will. Mark Russell. Giving way to that point, of course we need independent scientific advice, but within the context of the legislation that we're passing here today, which will put in a clear backstop, a golden rule, and set the context for that independent scientific advice, and also set the context for commercial development. Drew Stevenson. Well, I, sim I simply conclude, presiding officer, by reminding us that, well, if the presiding officer allows me, yes. John Scott. Uh, I thank Stuart Stevenson for taking the intervention and appreciate the indulgence of the presiding officer in this regard. But we've already heard today from the Cabinet Secretary an admission that the licensing regime and the regulatory regime is not fit for purpose. Is he now suggesting, as I think he is, and I'm tended to agree with him, and he's one of the fathers of this House, so to speak, that indeed the processes of this Parliament as well are being called into question here because they have not... Um, allowed this matter to be properly debated and aired and evidence taken in Parliament, and that's allegedly within the processes of this Parliament. So are they themselves to be called into question? Stuart Stevenson. Well, let me really finally, for the third time, try and conclude. Um, I don't think we should push the boat too far on the subject of our processes, but I think it is an unusual approach, and when we've taken it in the past, it has sometimes led us to difficulty when a committee has not had the opportunity to take evidence from all the interested parties. I'm absolutely certain the committee would conclude that we should protect kelp and that we should legislate to do so. so I think I've passed that. Well, if the presiding officer permits. Andy Whiteman. I very much thank the member for taking intervention. He will be familiar with the standing orders of this parliament. Standing Order 9.85D uh, uh, allows uh, the, any, the, the, uh, the mover of the, 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 the bill, the government in this case, uh, to move a motion to return something back to Stage 2 for detailed consideration for as long as may be the case if they feel that that's uh, necessary. So I would just challenge the idea that the process of this Parliament are not up to the kind of uh, developments we've seen in this bill. Stuart Stevenson. Um, well... For the fourth time, I'll try and finish. Um, presiding officer, I think it's a very simple matter that I'm trying to address. The committees of this parliament have not had the opportunity to consider in detail what is precisely the importance of the issue that causes me to say we should have uh, done this. I hope that in future we will do it and I will vote for the amendments before us when we vote very shortly. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. Just for uh, clarity, there are no procedural questions for me to rule on. All the amendments were deemed admissible. These are arguments, and there are arguments for you as a parliament to consider. I call the Cabinet Secretary before I call Mark Ruskell to wind up. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and you'll be very grateful that despite my legal background, I have absolutely no appetite for extended discussions about um, parliamentary standing orders or anything connected thereto. Um, I, I do want to correct one thing, which is that I do not recall at any point saying the licensing, uh, licensing regime was not fit for purpose. I said exactly the opposite. I think the issues around seaweed harvesting have shown that there are some serious questions that we need to have a look at across all of the forms of seaweed harvesting. I think Joanne Lamont made some very, very fair points. 
This is already a growing industry and the potential, for example, of farming has not yet been fully explored in Scotland, much less the harvesting of wild kelp. But I think members need to be aware that right now there are five different methods of harvesting kelp, only one of which has become controversial and only one of which currently would have required to go forward uh, for a license if there was, there was going to be continuing uh, activity. And I think in view of that, and I'm happy to share that with uh, the uh, members in the chamber if they wish to see the difference between these five different methods and that might help them understand some of the issues because some of what is called hand harvesting is actually at a fair scale um, and arguably in my view might be something that you might want to look at licensing for as well and that's the kind of thing that I want us to look at with the whole of this uh, uh, seaweed harvesting review. So um, I do think that uh, um, that while we have all probably become rather more expert in seaweed harvesting than we were when we uh, began this process, that there is still a great deal to learn about it, a great deal to understand about it. And I think that uh, some of the issues and some of the concerns that have been raised today are absolutely valid. However, the debate is being had, decisions have got to be made, and I've made it very clear where the government stands on those. Thank you, and I call Mark Ruskell to wind up and to press or Thank withdraw you. the Thank amendment. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, sometimes in politics, we have moments where we can make a change for good. Um, they may be unexpected. Uh, they may appear to sit awkwardly within a legislative process, but to ignore them would be wrong. We've just passed a continuity bill in this parliament that dealt with a wide range of issues over a very short period of time. There was limited time to take evidence and to scrutinize. But I believe we came up with a robust piece of legislation. I'm looking and Mr. Mr. Russell is nodding his head on that point. In terms of Johan Lamont's point, is all commercial interest bad? Of course it's not. But commercial interest, commercial activity needs to sustain itself over generations and generations to come. Generations of her forebears, generations of the young people that are in the gallery here today. It has to be sustainable, it has to be in the long-term interest. And that's why it's important the government has launched this wide sector review, looking not just at the uh, current uh, applications that are being put through licensing, but other forms of harvesting extraction. Farming, we've learned so much about farming in the last few weeks. The experience of the Faroese in developing a vibrant sector which can create those jobs of tomorrow for generations and generations to come. Serving our pharmaceutical industry, serving our food sector, growing jobs, growing growth in remote and vulnerable communities in the Northwest. Now I think we're, we're at a moment here today where we can take this decision. And I welcome the constructive discussions that I've had with the Cabinet Secretary over the last few weeks, particularly over the sector review. And I also welcome the support that I've had in committee from Claudia Beamish and Alex Rowley and the open-mindedness of members such as Finlay Carson on this issue as well. And I also welcome uh, the work of John Finney and Gail Ross channeling those concerns from businesses, from businesses in the west coast of Scotland into this committee, into this chamber and particularly welcome the work of Elsa McClellan and the Ollipool Sea Savers who are with us here today. We're in a good place now with this. There is a sector review. There is a hard backstop now in this bill. It is up for industry to innovate around that and to come up with the industry that is needed for the future. Thank you. Now, could I ask, I believe Mr. Ruskell wishes to withdraw Amendment 6, am I right? That is... So I'm pressing uh, six to eight, presiding officer. That's right. So I think you actually have to withdraw uh, Amendment Six because you had to move it to have for, for us to have the debate. So if member could withdraw. I will withdraw. withdraw. And does any member object to Amendment Six being withdrawn? No. That's good. Can I call Amendment Seven in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated? Mark Ruskell to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. I call Amendment Eight in the name of Mark Ruskell. Mark Russell to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. I call amendment 19 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you very much. The question is that amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. 
I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated. Cabinet Secretary to move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. I turn now to Group 7, Community Benefit Requests. And I call Amendment 42 in the name of Lee MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 44. Lee MacArthur to move Amendment 42 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. As I said earlier, this bill um, is or should be about ensuring the island and coastal communities have more local control uh, over and benefit from the current Crown State assets in Scotland. At stage two, I moved amendments that aimed uh, at making this happen through empowering local authorities to determine how community benefit schemes are set and monies then raised and allocated. I've taken on board some of the concerns uh, that were raised by the Cabinet Secretary and uh, committee members, uh, including uh, the oversight on my part that seemed to suggest that Orkney would be the sole beneficiary of the amendments uh, and hope that amendments 42 and 44 will now secure the support across the chamber. Uh, over the last 40 years, local management and commercial extraction of marine resources uh, have been achieved through formal arrangements such as works licensing under the Orkney and Zetland Acts and agreements with the oil industry. These arrangements have worked well to local as well as national advantage. Um, that track record of our island authorities has been recognised and rests on the principle that local communities should be compensated for the disruption and inconvenience associated with development work. We see this in relation to terrestrial planning, albeit on a voluntary basis. We're also seeing it in the offshore sector, um, albeit again on a voluntary and patchy basis. Fundamentally, however, communities that have to endure the burden of development, dislocation, risk and exploitation of scarce resources must be involved in decision making about which developments happen and which do not. They should also determine how related community benefit is agreed. As I said at stage two, much of what I've said sits very comfortably with commitments made by the government in their prospectus empowering Scotland's island communities. And like the island authorities, I believe that that commitment needs to be in this act and therefore I move Amendment 42 in my name. Thank you very much. And uh, I've got two indications for members who wish to speak. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just very briefly, again, this is a, uh, an amendment which seeks to make a, uh, introduce a regulation making power for community benefit request scheme, a request which must not unreasonably be unreasonably with, with, withheld. And again, this seeks to uphold the Smith Commission recommendation in paragraph 33 responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved uh, to local authority areas. I very much support uh, amendments 42 uh, and 44 and Greens will be voting for them this evening. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, and I would just like to seek clarification from Liam MacArthur um, or indeed An Andy Whiteman. I think it's Liam MacArthur, Presiding Officer, who, who sums up just about um, uh, other parts of Scotland beyond the islands, and if he's got any thoughts on community benefit in relation to those, if, if indeed they, for instance, they don't apply um, uh, or are not able to apply as at present for um, uh, any rights of, or mem sorry, management of the seabed, uh, whether um, he would see that they could still possibly uh, get some community benefit from what they might visually see or have some impact on their, uh, on their uh, environment. And I wonder if he might um, answer that in his concluding remarks. Thank you. John Scott, to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary. No, thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Amendments 42 and 44 would place a duty on Scottish ministers to make provision for a community benefit request <coughs> scheme if asked for by a local authority. A similar amendment was introduced at stage two and was regarded as being unnecessary as Scottish ministers already made a commitment that Scottish coastal communities will benefit from the net revenue from the Crown and State marine assets. In addition, the Scottish Government encouraged developers to, develop, to deliver community benefit on a voluntary basis and the Scottish Government has already discussed with COSLA and agreed how to deliver these benefits to coastal communities from the net reserves. On a different but related point, one has to wonder how land locked local authorities are not to be disadvantaged by such be payments being made only to coastal authorities. But perhaps that's an issue for another day. Thank you. I call the Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. The purpose of these amendments appears to be to create a process whereby particular local authorities can request from the Scottish Ministers permission to generate community benefit from marine development occurring within uh, the relevant Scottish marine region 
in relation to Scottish Crown Estate assets out to 12 nautical miles. It doesn't create a process about how these benefits are actually to be generated. I'm of the view that these amendments are unnecessary. There is no need to include within legislation a right for a local authority to seek permission from the Scottish ministers to set up such a scheme. A local authority can already implement a scheme of this nature without permission of the Scottish ministers. The Scottish Government has also has no powers to oblige developers to pay community benefits for such schemes. And there are examples of local community benefit schemes being put in place on a voluntary basis by developers in Scotland. And against this background, we are resisting Amendment 42 and consequential Amendment 44. Firstly, as there's no need to include within legislation a right to do this, local authorities can create such a scheme themselves. And secondly, as there are a number of practical difficulties in how these amendments would work in practice. And some of them were referred to by Claudia Beamish. As a result of the way that the amendment defines a relevant local authority, it has the effect of only applying to six local authorities, Argyll and Butte Council, Western Isles, Highland Council, North Ayrshire Council, Orkney Council and Shetland Council. It therefore excludes all of the other coastal local authorities, uh, which may be in advance of Liam MacArthur's, uh, an advance on Liam MacArthur's Orkney specific proposal at stage two, but is still a rather odd formulation. Additionally, it is unclear how Amendment 42 will work in practice. The amendment seeks to create a process whereby one of the six local authorities that I've mentioned can request permission to generate community benefit from marine development within its relevant Scottish marine region from the foreshore to 12 nautical miles as defined by the Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015, but marine development is not defined. The marine areas as defined in the Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 do not correspond exactly with the local authority boundaries. We've already had this uh, uh, discussed. Some of the marine areas are shared between more than one local authority. And the amendment doesn't set out a mechanism whereby competing claims to generate community benefit from the same marine area by different local authorities are determined. A further technical concern about this amendment is that imposing a duty on ministers to make regulations which are subject to the affirmative procedure is problematic as the regulations can only be made if a draft is already approved by the Parliament. I also remain of the view that these amendments are not necessary. The Scottish ministers have already made a commitment to ensure that island and coastal communities will benefit from the net revenue from the Scottish Crown Estate marine assets. We have had constructive discussions with COSLA and have agreed an interim mechanism for local authorities to receive a share of the net revenue out to 12 nautical miles. This local funding will not be hypothecated, but we would expect the local authorities to be transparent and accountable to their communities on how that money is spent. Arrangements are currently being made to distribute the revenue to coastal councils later this year, and we have agreed with COSLA that we will review the interim arrangements, including whether we can establish a closer link with the net revenue raised in a local authority area. And I'd ask the member not to press Amendment 42 or 44. Thank you very much. And I call Lee MacArthur to wind up in this section. Uh, thanks very much. Can I thank all those uh, who contributed? I thank uh, Andy uh, Whiteman. Um, I, I thought, having mentioned the Smith Commission enough in my last contributions, uh, I would avoid doing so, but he was not so uh, inhibited. But I think he's absolutely right that this does uh, honour the uh, recommendations of the uh, Smith Commission. Uh, in terms of Claudia Beamish, uh, again, I would acknowledge the constructive engagement she's had with me uh, on this uh, amendment. I think the regulatory powers would enable some of the concerns uh, she expressed about uh, other local authorities uh, to, uh, to be uh, addressed. But um, I think uh, it, John Scott picked up a, a very uh, similar issue and went on um, to uh, insist that um, this was captured in terms of net benefits. I very much look forward if he's going to vote down uh, this amendment uh, for his support when we turn to the next grouping uh, on the issue of net benefits. He and the Cabinet Secretary both referred uh, to the discussions with COSLA. Uh, I think it should be pointed out that um, however the discussions with COSLA are, are, are going, there are still, I think, uh, anxieties amongst the island authorities about the way in which uh, these revenues uh, will be uh, distributed uh, and therefore I think to suggest that uh, all is all is well and there are no concerns uh, to be addressed is perhaps uh, a little naive but on the basis of what I've heard uh, this afternoon I think it was probably best not to press uh, this amendment at this time and to return to it under the net benefits uh, uh, groupings in the next session. Thank you. So, in that case, could I ask Mr MacArthur to withdraw uh, Amendment 42? Uh, withdrawn. Are members happy for Amendment 42 to be withdrawn?
we are. Can I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated? Cabinet uh, Secretary to move formally. Moved. This is Amendment 21. Moved. That's moved. Now, before we vote on that, we'll call the amendments to the amendment. Can I call Amendment 21E in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated? Mark Ruskell to move or not? Moved. Move? That is moved. The question is that Amendment 21A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. This is the first division in the group, so we will have a one-minute division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 21A in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 89. There were no, sorry, nobody voted against, and there were 28 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendment 21B in the name of Mark Ruskell, already debated. Mark Ruskell to move or not move? Moved. That is moved. The question is that Amendment 21B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. We'll move to division. This will be a 30 second division. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 21B in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 89. There were no votes against. There were 28 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 21 as amended. Uh, press. Press. So the question is that Amendment 21 as amended be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. We turn now to Group 8, which is a list of the Scottish Crown Estate assets and liabilities. I call Amendment 3 in the name of John Scott, grouped with Amendment 5. John Scott to move Amendment 3 and speak to both amendments in the group. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 3 and Amendment 5 place a duty on Scottish Ministers to maintain and publish a list of assets and make the list available for publication. Such a list would provide at a glance what is owned by Scottish Ministers and I hope that this opportunity to lead by example will be accepted by Scottish ministers given the current expectation raised in the land reform legislation that who owns what under private ownership should be easily accessible and public knowledge in Scotland. This amendment responds to the stage one report recommendation 334 that the Crown Estate Scotland should establish and maintain a list of assets and liabilities. Such lists, if published annually, would also provide an annual inventory, which again would allow comparison year on year of assets and liabilities and make very public and available for scrutiny the evolving shape of the Crown Estates under their new obligations. I hope these amendments will be accepted by Parliament. Thank you very much. And no member has indicated they wish to speak of this group. I would call the, thank you, I would call the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary is in a conversation, but uh, no other member has. 
No okay. other member has indicated the wish to speak, Cabinet Secretary. Would you <laughs> thank like you, to... Presiding Officer. Can I just apologise to the Chamber? Um, I thank Mr Scott for lodging these amendments and for raising the issue for debate. Um, there was considerable interest at Stage 1 in the assets and liabilities of the Scottish Crown Estate, and these amendments reflect some of the concerns expressed. In the Stage 1 report, the Environment, Climate Change uh, and Land Reform Committee recommended that Crown Estate Scotland establish and maintain a list of Crown Estate Scotland assets and the liabilities attached to these. I certainly acknowledge the need to know who is the manager of any particular Scottish Crown Estate. The information is needed to determine who is responsible for the asset, who can give permission to access the land and who can grant a lease. These are legitimate questions. At present, Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management maintains details of the assets it manages and the annual report and accounts will give a picture of the value of the assets by key sectors. The accounts also contain information on the liabilities of the organisation. Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management has an interactive map on its website showing indicative location of assets under their control which have live agreements, including leases, in place. Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management also undertakes condition surveys and valuations of buildings and other property as appropriate. Ministers can also direct managers to maintain an asset register in addition to the requirements on managers regarding management plans and annual reports. Collecting, managing and reporting information on assets and liabilities forms part of the business as usual approach that has been operating since devolution, while of course respecting that some information is commercially sensitive and needs to be treated as confidential. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, Elsewhere. for taking the intervention. Can I just ask the Cabinet Secretary if she could tell me how publicly available, how readily available these lists and inventories would be um, at a glance, so to speak, three clicks and could somebody find them? Well, I'd like to reassure Mr Scott that we are as concerned as he is that the public um, is easily able to find out what assets form part of the estate, what are the categories of liabilities and who is managing any Scottish Crown Estate asset. And officials are currently in discussions on how the information on assets can be made more widely available. So this is an active uh, consideration. I can provide reassurance that there will be publicly available information on asset assets and liabilities but I don't consider there to be a need to require this under legislation, and I ask Mr Scott not to press his amendment. Thank you very much. And I call John Scott to wind up to press or withdraw Amendment 3. Uh, I will withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Mr Scott wishes to withdraw the amendment. 3. Does anybody disagree? Thank you. Call Amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. We turn now to Group 9, which is the transfer of net revenues to relevant local authorities. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Lee MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 45. Lee MacArthur to move Amendment 43 and speak to both amendments. Thank you very much, Chair. Presiding officer, we've covered some of this ground before. I've moved amendments earlier in relation to the uh, devolution uh, of management powers over the Crown Estate assets, uh, also in relation uh, to the devolution of responsibility uh, for determining uh, community benefit. Um, these, amend these two amendments follow a similar pattern in relation to net revenues, that was which were mentioned by both John Scott and the Cabinet Secretary in relation to the last uh, grouping. I didn't think they would necessarily be uh, hugely controversial. Uh, quoting from the uh, Scottish Government's Empowering Scotland's Islands Communities perspective, it talks about net income from activities within 12 nautical miles would be passed to individual councils and each will be responsible for administering their own fund. The First Minister, uh, back in 2016, two years later, was talking about not only will our island communities benefit from 100% of the Crown Estate revenues that they raise, but they will have a greater say uh, in how the assets of the Crown State uh, are managed. And uncontroversial, um, I, I think, and, and support for those uh, aspirations across the Chamber. The island authorities, uh, not unreasonably, are looking again for uh, those specific commitments uh, to be attached uh, to the bill. Uh, that is what 40, uh, Amendment 43 uh, and 45 uh, seek to achieve. Uh, I move Amendment 43 and look forward to the uh, debate. Thank you. A couple of members have indicated they wish to speak. I call John Scott to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. Amendments 43 and 45 would create a duty for Scottish Ministers to make provision for a scheme to provide for the transfer of net revenue to relevant local authorities where this relates to marine developments and other matters as Scottish Ministers consider appropriate. 
and are similar to Amendments 43 already debated at Stage 2 by the Committee and by the Government. Now, as before, we believe these two amendments to be unnecessary, as the Scottish Government has said and made commitments that Scottish coastal communities will benefit from the net revenue from the Scottish Crown Estate marine assets. And I believe them, notwithstanding Liam MacArthur's, um, notwithstanding Liam MacArthur's concerns about the believability of government assurances. Um, further, these amendments would require that 100% of net revenue from development in marine areas from Crown Estate assets would be given to relevant local authorities, with which we just simply do not agree. As I said before, no such similar scheme to benefit landlocked local authorities has been suggested or provided for in this bill. And while I understand Liam MacArthur's ambitions behind these amendments, I regret that I don't think they're entirely fair to others. Call Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We support Amendments 43 uh, and 45. They place, um, they, they further um, the commitments given by all parties in this Parliament in the Smith Commission. Again, I quote paragraph 33, responsibility for the management of those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas. Uh, Lee MacArthur's amendment places on a statutory footing a long-standing promise made by the First Minister at a meeting of the Convention on the Highlands and Islands in Kirkwall on the 1st of June 2015. And I'm very pleased that John Scott um, believes the Scottish Government's commitments uh, on this matter. I, I do too. I don't put in, I have any doubt about the Scottish Government's commitment to transfer the net revenues. But we're passing law today. The current government's commitments may not last beyond the life of this particular administration. A future government, perhaps including Mr. Scott, might not want to transfer those revenues. The question today is whether this parliament feels that those net revenues should be properly transferred to Scotland's local authorities. And therefore, we support putting the commitment, the welcome commitment that's been given, made by the Scottish Government and upholds the commitments made by the Smith Commission by all parties. We support putting that on a statutory footing. Thank you and I call the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Ministers have committed to providing the net revenue generated after all costs have been deducted from Scottish Crown Estate marine assets out to 12 nautical miles for the benefit of coastal communities. Indeed, the Scottish Government and COSLA have agreed an interim formula-based approach to distribute the net revenue from Scottish Crown Estate marine assets out to 12 nautical miles to each island and coastal local authority. I therefore see no need for legislation on this matter, given the commitment given and the agreement with COSLA. In addition, there are technical issues about the operability of Amendment 43, and this amendment would only cover part of the agreement with COSLA. The amendment is only applicable to relevant local authorities, and these are those listed in section 61 to 66 of the Schedule to the Islands Scotland Act 2018, namely the Shetland Islands, Orkney Island, uh, Western Isles, Highland, Argyll and Butte, and uh, North Ayrshire. It excludes all of the other coastal local authorities. Amendment 43 requires that a scheme should set out a process by which each of these relevant local authorities is to receive 100% of net revenue insofar as that revenue directly relates to marine development in its respective marine area from Scottish Crown Estate assets from mean high water spring tides out to 12 nautical miles as defined by the Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015. The Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 that created 11 marine regions in Scotland, the boundaries of which are described in the order. They do not necessarily align with the boundaries of local authority areas in Scotland, as we've already uh, uh, spoken to uh, uh, this afternoon. And this, in my view, creates a particular problem in the delivery of the effect of this amendment. In particular, the boundaries of Highland, Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire local authorities do not correspond directly to any one particular Scottish marine region. And again, what is meant by revenues relating to marine development is unclear as this is not defined. A further issue with Amendment 43 is that imposing a duty on ministers to make regulations which are subject to the affirmative procedure is problematic as the regulations can only be made if a draft is approved by the Parliament. I also believe that Amendment 43 and consequential Amendment 45 are unnecessary in light of the government's commitment that coastal and island local authorities will benefit from the net revenue from Scottish Crown Estate marine assets. This commitment is demonstrated by our agreement with COSLA. Moreover, as I've highlighted, it's not clear that Amendment 43 will work as, attended, as intended as the marine areas set out 
in the Scottish Marine Regions Order 2015 do not correspond to each of the local authority areas. The amendment would also create a different procedure for these six councils compared with the other coastal local authorities that will benefit from the net revenue from the marine assets of the Scottish Crown Estate out to 12 nautical miles as currently agreed. As a result, the marine areas of, of the, each of the following local authorities are not properly defined. That's Argyll and Butte Council, Western Isles, Highland Council, North Ayrshire Council, Orkney Council and Shetland Council. And this amendment creates difficulties, particularly where there is an overlap where more than one local authority area has its boundaries within a particular marine region and where a marine region is within the boundaries of both one of the six relevant local authorities and another local authority. The effect of the amendment being that a relevant local authority would be entitled to 100% of the net revenues of marine development in that marine region to the detriment of the local authority, which also shares that marine region in which the revenue was generated. In particular, Highland Council shares the Moray Firth, Scottish Marine Region with Murray Council and Aberdeenshire Council. It would be inappropriate for this amendment to result in all of the Scottish Crown Estate net revenue resulting from marine development within the Murray Firth Marine Region to automatically be transferred to Highland Council to the detriment of coastal communities in Murray Council and Aberdeenshire Council areas. In addition, Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire Councils share the Clyde Scottish Marine Region with other local authorities, including South Ayrshire and Inverclyde. It would be equally inappropriate for Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire to receive 100% of the net revenue resulting from marine development within the Clyde Scottish Marine Zone to the detriment of the other coastal communities in South Ayrshire and Inverclyde local authority areas. It is also unclear how Argyll and Butte and North Ayrshire local authorities could both receive 100% of the net revenue for marine development within a Scottish marine zone that lies within both of their local authority boundaries. These reasons are the, the ones why I do not support amendments 43 and 45, and I would urge Mr MacArthur not to press them. Thank you very much. And I call Lee MacArthur to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 43. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding uh, Officer. I'm being encouraged to clarify uh, what assets in Airdrie and Shorts will be protected as a result of these uh, amendments. Uh, can I thank John Scott, uh, Andy Whiteman and the Cabinet Secretary uh, for their uh, contributions? I think Andy Whiteman's absolutely right. It's not about whether or not you believe uh, the government. It's about um, legislating uh, and ensuring that uh, those assurances um, succeed uh, in any, uh, any current uh, government and, and I think John Scott himself uh, was on record as saying uh, that he doesn't support the 100% uh, net benefit uh, to local authorities and therefore immediately uh, there's a question mark about how uh, resilient the uh, assurances that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has given uh, would be into the, into the future. I think as Orkney Islands Council have made clear they see um, this commitment as being about fairness and equitability, about providing an incentive to encourage and promote marine activity in our respective waters. And while I, I listened very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary had to say, and I think she outlined uh, a number of, of legitimate uh, concerns in terms of where that net benefit would accrue, uh, I think there is still a concern in Orkney in Shetland uh, about where that net benefit is going to accrue. It can't be um, some uh, algorithmic uh, concoction uh, come up with by the, uh, by the, the Scottish Government. Uh, I think there is rightly an expectation on the basis of the Smith Commission recommendations that the net benefits uh, accruing from the activity uh, in the waters around Orkney uh, should accrue uh, to Orkney Islands Council and to the uh, Orkney community. And I give way to Claudia Beamish. Claudia Beamish. I thank the member for taking intervention because um, in terms of what the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted, uh, surely um, would the member not agree with me that there are now um, councils which have been identified which aren't in, in Schedule 60 to 61 of the Islands Act, which um, may be disadvantaged by this amendment if it goes through, in, in that they could well have um, looking out over um, uh, offshore wind uh, installations or having, having involvement in some way and it would be very hard to divide it up and, and I wonder whether he might consider that in whether he's going to press the amendment. Lee MacArthur. Uh, well, I, I mean, there's a spoiler alert. I think I'm going to withdraw uh, the amendment, not least because of the protestations of my colleague from the North East in response to the Cabinet Secretary's <laughs> intimation about what's happening in the Murray Firth. Um, but I think, though, there is a real issue here about uh, going forward beyond the first year or the, or the second year 
uh, where, in a sense, there's an approximation made of the revenues that accrue to different local authorities. I think something more specific, particularly in those areas like uh, Orkney and Shetland, where there is no dubiety uh, in, in terms of where those net uh, benefits uh, should accrue. But on the basis of Andy Whiteman, yeah. Um, Andy Whiteman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I hear the members intending to withdraw. Um, that the member will be aware that understanding orders 9.85C, the minister would be able to uh, lodge a motion without uh, notice um, that the remaining proceedings of stage three be adjourned to a later day. And that would allow the cabinet secretary, if she were so minded, to put on the face of the bill statutory provisions about net uh, revenue transfers to be re remitted to stage two committee, to be sorted out and to be brought into the bill. And that's an option uh, he might wish to pursue with the cabinet secretary. I'm very grateful to Andy Whiteman for that. I have to say he, he, would, he will want to look at the video later to see the body language of those members uh, sitting behind him as he, uh, as he suggested that. I, I think there are concerns around, uh, around the way that this uh, amendment would apply. I'm, I'm prepared to uh, accept those. But I think um, there, is, uh, there is an opportunity for the Cabinet Secretary, if she, if she so wishes, uh, to, to give an undertaking along the lines that uh, Andy Whiteman uh, has suggested. But I think what, uh, what, I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to put onto the, onto the record is there is an expectation now um, that the commitment that was given by the government in its empowering uh, our island communities, uh, in its uh, commitments as recently as, as uh, June 2018, there is now an expectation that 100% of the net benefits uh, accruing in, the water, in, in developments in the waters around Orkney, in Shetland and other island and coastal communities will accrue to those uh, communities. But on that basis and the concerns that have been raised, uh, I would seek to withdraw Amendment 43. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member wishes to withdraw Amendment 43. Does anyone object? No one objects. Very good. Thank you. Can I call Amendment 4 in the name of John Scott, already debated with Amendment 1. John Scott to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Lee MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 42. Lee MacArthur to move or not move? Okay, not moved. Not moved. And I call Amendment 45, also in the name of Lee MacArthur... Mr MacArthur, to move or not move? not move? That's not moved. I call Amendment 5, in the name of John Scott, already debated, with Amendment 3. John Scott, to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. I call Amendment 23, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated, with Amendment 9. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? Moved. Thank you. The question is, that Amendment 23 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 24, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? Thank you. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And that concludes the amending stage of the bill. Now, at this stage in proceedings, members might be aware, uh, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of this bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the franchise for the Scottish parliamentary elections or the electoral system. In the case of this bill, my view is that no provision of the Scottish Crown Estate Bill does so. Therefore, my determination is that the bill does not require a supermajority at stage three. So now we're going to move on to a debate on stage three. I think we'll just take a, shall we just take a few moments? I'm going to suspend just for uh, a few minutes to allow the minister and other members to take a short break and we'll resume in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Short suspension.
I'm going to call you to order shortly, so you can all make sure you're in your seats, please. The next item of business is a debate on motion 14822 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on Scottish Crown Estate Bill. I can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today is a historic occasion. This bill is the first time this Parliament has ever legislated on the management of the Scottish Crown Estate. It is therefore a landmark bill and continues the process of the devolution of the Scottish Crown Estate that started with the Smith Commission and the Scotland Act 2016. Until now, the management of the Crown Estate has been governed by the Crown Estate Act 1961, which is a reflection of its time predating the discovery of the North Sea oil fields, the development of aquaculture, and of course, offshore renewables. However, administrative arrangements need to change with the times and arrangements for the management of the Scottish Crown Estate should reflect devolution. The bill enables local authorities, communities and harbour authorities to take on the management of Scottish Crown Estate assets and to manage them in a way that benefits local communities within an overall national governance framework. Our ambition is for the Scottish Crown Estate to make a difference for the people of Scotland at both the local and the national level. The work of the Parliament today and during the course of the bill will help to deliver that ambition, ensuring that the management of the Scottish Crown Estate has a statutory basis to contribute to the economic development, regeneration, social and environmental well-being of Scotland, and of course, to sustainable development in Scotland. The net revenue from the assets will be paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund, and those out to 12 nautical miles will be distributed to coastal local authorities. It is important, therefore, that the estate is overall run in a way which protects and enhances the public finances, rather than being a drain on them. It's also important to recognise that there are parts of the estate which cannot be expected to make money and other parts where a less commercial approach may be best to secure wider benefits. The bill enshrines the accountability of the Scottish Crown Estate to the Parliament, modernises the statutory framework for management and assets and creates new processes for further devolution of the Scottish Crown Estate. For the first time, there will be a statutory requirement to prepare a national strategy for the Scottish Crown Estate and a duty to act in the way best calculated to further the achievement of sustainable development in Scotland. By including new duties on sustainable development as well as wider socio-economic and environmental factors, the bill requires managers of the Scottish Crown Estate to contribute to multiple outcomes. The Scottish Crown Estate also includes the management of seabed rights and its diverse portfolio encompasses vibrant sectors such as offshore renewables, which deliver both economic and environmental benefits. From my engagement with Crown Estate Scotland staff at Bellsbury, I am aware of their high standard of professionalism, as well as their commitment to maintain and improve the value of the Scottish Crown Estate. I've seen the great work being done in areas such as the environment, renewable energy, tourism, recreation, and support for community development projects. Now, of course, it will not have escaped colleagues that the issue of kelp harvesting has arisen during the progress of the bill, um, and at points has appeared to almost overwhelm uh, the original purposes of the bill. It has surfaced a range of issues concerning the regulation of current and proposed harvesting activity in this sector. The issues are complex, many and varied, and require the gathering of further evidence to conclude how we should proceed in future. I remain of the view that the Scottish Crown Estate Bill is not the optimal place to control seaweed harvesting, but we are where we are. However, the amendments we have agreed to the bill today provide a good foundation for better regulation of this activity in advance of further work to better understand the issues. So my announcement today of a review of the regulatory regime for all kelp harvesting activity in Scotland recognises that there is current interest and there may be more interest in future in new types of seaweed harvesting in Scottish waters. And I hope all those who are um, concerned to be part of this burgeoning industry um, will continue to engage uh, with the government and relevant authorities uh, and indeed I can advise that uh, uh, we will be writing to MBL today uh, in respect of that particular um, aspect. I'd like to express my special thanks and gratitude to the Crown Estate Stakeholder Advisory Group, to members of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for their contributions and to my officials for their engagement and work on all aspects in the preparation of the bill. And I'd also like to thank Crown Estate Scotland staff for their contribution to the process and particularly for the advice and support given to my officials on aspects of the technical drafting of the bill. 
I also commend all the Crown Estate Scotland staff for their dedication in continuing the good management of the assets and progressing opportunities for pilots of local management while the bill has progressed through Parliament. I'm very conscious of the uncertainty that a political process can bring to people's day-to-day -day activities in their workplace. With the enactment of this bill, we can move beyond that uncertainty towards a clear future which is full of opportunity for the estate. The bill has been improved and strengthened as a result of the parliamentary process, and I very much welcome that. Presiding officer, I want to conclude by saying that this is the start of a new era in the management of the Scottish Crown Estate, where the assets are managed for the benefit of the people of Scotland while protecting their value and to the benefit of the communities of Scotland. I move that the Parliament agrees that the Scottish Crown Estate Bill be passed. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on John Scott to open for the Conservatives. Mr Scott, uh, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. And may I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and refer a member to my register of interest for other interests. Can I also welcome the passage of the Crown the Scottish Crown Estate Bill following on from the Smith Commission recommendation in the Scotland Act 2016, which devolved the management of the Scottish Crown Estate to the Scottish Parliament. Originally part of the UK-wide Crown Estate, the Crown Estate in Scotland has a wide range of assets, including rural estates, rights to naturally occurring gold and silver across Scotland, as well as moorings, ports and harbours, the seabed out to 12 nautical miles, including, interestingly, carbon dioxide storage, out to 200 nautical miles, as well as several other assets. So, presiding officer, you will note we have had to consider how many different assets will be managed in future by the Scottish Government. And I hope the bill before us today delivers properly on the different focus the Government has set for managing these assets. Well, previously, the sole purpose of the Crown Estate was to deliver funding to the Scottish or UK Treasury the passage of this bill seeks to further devolve, where appropriate, responsibility for the management of these assets away from the Scottish Government to Crown Estate managers and other bodies such as local authorities and harbour boards and community groups. In addition, Crown Estate managers as well are seeking to enhance the value of the assets and monitor. In addition, Crown Estate managers, as well as seeking to enhance the value of the assets and monitor and enhance the income from them, will also be required to do this in a way best calculated to further the achievements of sustainable development in Scotland, as well as contribute to the promotion of the improvement of economic development and regeneration, social well-being and environmental well-being, which feels to me like a tall order for Crown Estate managers. Certainly enhancing the income from the various assets with all these other duties, new duties placed on managers, will in my view prove problematic and likely to deliver a much reduced income stream to the Scottish Government. However, we shall see. Turning now to another area of significant debate in the Bill and while, and while abstaining on Mark Ruskell's amendment to protect kelp beds and environmental grounds, I very much regret the way this prohibition in the harvesting of Laminaria hyperborea has been passed into law. Indeed, this event provokes real questions about the stage two process of considering amendments in any future bill, and it, and it now appears significant announcement and alteration, alterations to bills can be considered and acted upon by committees, government and parliament without any formal evidence being heard by a bill committee. And Stuart Stevenson very much highlighted that. Of course. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Mr Scott, for making way. The rules of this Parliament do, do allow for this. They do allow for the mover of a, a, a introducer of a bill uh, to move a motion without notice to return it to stage two for further consideration. So there's nothing standing in the way of further consideration of these matters apart from the decision of the government as to whether to utilise that power. Does he agree with me on that? John yeah, Scott. Yes, uh, I do. And indeed, I raised this process with the appropriate bodies at the time and was told that to achieve such uh, a reversion to the stage uh, one process, which is what indeed would have to be done um, to gather evidence again, because that's what happened in the Justice Bill um, some 10 or so years ago, maybe 12 years ago, when it was chaired by the then convener, Bill Aiken, 
Um, they had to go back to the stage one process. It was regarding stocking, and it was with regard to an amendment that one of my constituents brought forward. And I'm certain the Cabinet Secretary will remember that, and possibly even Stuart Stevenson as well. We reverted to the stage one process, took the information, and then went back to the stage two process, and took amendments thereafter, and the stocking legislation that is so worthwhile came into being at that time. However, when I looked into this, I was told that because the bill had completed the stage two process, that it was unable to... Uh, they had now left the committee, so to speak. It was unable to activate the process that you um, tell me all uh, and describe, and I've just described back to you. So I thank you for your intervention, and you're absolutely correct, but I was I made aware that it was not appropriate in this case. Oh, my goodness, I've lost my place in this uh, speech. Um, more awkwardly, however, uh, and... Uh, Indeed, this event provokes real questions about the stage two process of considering amendments. Yes, I've said that already. More awkwardly, still in this case, is that the developmental scientific work, which would have built on the age-old industry of kelp harvesting, had been supported and developed and helped develop by government agencies such as Marine Scotland, distinguished universities and other government agencies over the last eight years with every regulatory hoop having been jumped through and every piece of government agency advice being acted upon. However, the significant regulatory process that MBL adhered to throughout will, will, will perhaps now not be completed, although perhaps one should take sucker from what the, the Cabinet Secretary has said today. In addition, other science-based businesses may now be deterred from investing in Scotland knowing that a regulatory developmental process in terms of product development supported by government agencies can be overturned almost whimsically by Parliament. Now, if it was difficult enough for our development agencies to persuade would-be investors to invest in Scotland, it, today it just became a little more difficult. But I welcome Joanne Lamont's supportive speech this afternoon and the reality check that it provided. In particular, I share and indeed have long worked to bring jobs and to support our remote and fragile coastal communities. And this process would, would and I hope might still bring 40 jobs to Malig. I also welcome Stuart Stevenson's contribution and agree with him that there has been a failure of process here and Marine Biopolymers Limited are collateral damage in, their failure, in this failure of process thus far. However, I take sucker from the Cabinet Secretary's announcement earlier of a root and branch review, and I hope that door may not be completely closed on the work of MBL. I note the Cab Secretary will, as part of this transformational change she hopes to bring about, will be looking to pilot schemes to take scientifically based developmental projects forward. And I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary will today be writing to MBL perhaps in this regard, although I know not, but I hope perhaps positively at least. Presiding officer, there are many good things about this bill and the continuing management of the four rural estates by Crown Estate Scotland has been welcomed by the NUS and Scottish Term Tenant Farmers Association as well as themselves. Um, I'm pleased to have been part of the work on this bill and I hope it turns out as we all hope that it will. Thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. Now, call Claudia Beanish to open for Labour. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Crown Estate speech. assets cover That's such a diverse range speech. of land, foreshore, seabed, rights and property, as we've heard from the Cabinet Secretary. And Scottish Labour welcomes the successful devolution of the management of responsibilities and revenues to Scotland, as called for in the Smith Commission. The Crown Estate is said to date back as far as 1066, I understand, uh, although perhaps Andy Whiteman might correct me on that. Uh, and many of these assets are steeped in Scottish cultural significance and history. Today's meaningful legislation transferring the management and revenue of these assets to the hands of managers across Scotland is very positive and empowering. My thanks to Cosler for their recent letter in support of the Crown Estate Bill that maximises local authority empowerment. This is a move in the direction of democratic empowerment and greater transparency. And I look forward to the opportunities for community empowerment as we see the process of double devolution. I'm reassured that local authorities will be able to act, as I understand it, as gatekeepers for consideration of community group uh, management proposals as well. Decentralising management will enable communities and local authorities 
to realise their ambitions for these assets and enjoy the social and economic benefits they deliver as well as the environmental ones. Greater consideration of local needs and accruing revenue to flow back into the communities will go a long way to help empower and improve the resilience of our rural and coastal communities. I have long fought for sustainable development to underpin everything this Parliament achieves, along with others. And I'm very pleased this ambition has been emphasised in the Cabinet Secretary's amendment today, uh, amending Section 7, which determines the principles by which managers must act. And I am afraid that John Scott and I will just have to agree to differ on that one. Uh, at stage two, we discussed how best to achieve this, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for working with Mark Roskell and myself to come to this very good solution. The, matter, the, ma the, sorry, the manner by which many Crown Estate assets are managed could have enormous repercussions on our natural world, so setting out sustainability at the core of the manager's decision so distinctly is very welcome. Of course, the issue of kelp has been the most, and perhaps only really contentious part of this bill. In this context, I welcome the passing of Amendment 21 in the Cabinet Secretary's name and her commitment to a complete review of the regulatory system of kelp harvesting activity. I recognise there are a number of categories and intricacies, and I hope this will act as a pathway to a robust framework for all kelp activities that is rooted in sustainability. May I assure um, the member John Scott, there is absolutely nothing whimsical about Scottish Labour's support for Mark Ruskell's amendment. I'm delighted this has passed today, and it is right that this is part of the framework uh, within which the, the review is set. Kelp forests are marine priority features with an enormous importance in our marine ecosystem, and any practice, whether it's fishing, farming, harvesting, that inhibits regrowth or reproduction is simply out of the question now. This Parliament has agreed time and again that sustainability is an absolute. For one thing, it makes business sense uh, to reassure um, Joanne Lamont if she was here, but I, I, she's not anymore. <laughs> but, but also for the sake of our environment and our climate change ambition. At a time when our seas are under pressure from climate change, and it's the forefront of our minds with this bill going forward for climate change, any new industry must be guaranteed in its sustainability. We're still at a frustratingly early stage of considering the benefits of blue carbon sequestration, but we know enough to understand that it will be important to have a helping hand in tackling climate change and that that should be enforced and not diminished. We know that coastal erosion and sea level rises will be an increasingly greater threat to communities and infrastructure who live by the sea. And the kelp is a natural barrier to the effects of storm damage. We also know that kelp forests provide an important feeding ground for some of our most endangered rare seabirds that are disappearing at a devastating rate. And we know that our existing fishing industry and other industries such as marine tourism rely on kelp forests uh, to, play, uh, to play host to juvenile fish for, for the fishing communities and uh, in order to replenish the stocks and keep their own industry sustainable. Marine protections can often fall foul of out of sight, out of mind, more so than conservation issues on land. Healthy ecosystems, ecosystems affect us all, but especially coastal communities who are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. These risks may be harder to grasp than the positive idea of a multi-million pound new industry, but they are vitally important as a, as, as a setting for the future. Labour supports this bill and what it sets out to do. It is appropriate delivery of the Smith Commission recommendation and provides a framework for a more progressive management of the Crown Estate assets for the future of us all in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Andy Whiteman to open for the Greens. Four minutes, please, Mr Whiteman. I thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As Cabinet Secretary is right, this is indeed a historic occasion. Scotland's Crown Estate goes further back than 1066, though. Uh, the ninth century has its origins when Scotland was a unified kingdom, and of course the Western Isles were only added in 1266, and the Northern Isles with their own distinctive traditions on these matters in 1472. This has been a long road uh, to this bill. I remember a late night taxi ride to Edinburgh from Glasgow some years ago in the company of Henry MacLeish, uh, the minister who was in fact in charge of steering the Scotland Act onto the statute book in 1998, and he told me of the frustrations of trying to secure devolution of the Crown Estate, a task he had to abandon at that time. And it's worth remembering why in 1999 the Parliament should 
have gained full control over the property rights, revenues and management of the Crown. These historic property rights, the foreshore, gold and silver, the seabed, are all defined by Scots law. Other Crown property rights are not part of the Crown estate, include Bona Vacantia, Ultima Aries and Treasure Trove, are also defined by Scots law's rights to, to which this, to this day are administered by the Crown Office in Edinburgh, where the Lord Advocate also upholds the common law rights under the guardianship of the Crown over the foreshore. In 1833, management of these assets that later comprised the Crown Estate were transferred to London from Edinburgh, and importantly and significantly, they did not form part of the civil list that had been established in 1760 through the surrender of the English Crown revenues. Thus, these historic rights remain constitutionally, legally and politically distinctive, since they are the rights of the Scottish Crown defined by Scots law that should have formed part of the 1998 Scotland Act. Some years later, it became very clear that the Crown Estate Commissioners, whose, whose lack of transparency and malign influence as a body corporate has blighted much of rural and marine Scotland, had secured the support of the Palace and the Treasury to block any reform. And so, although the property rights were devolved in 1999, the revenues were not. And I just want to put on record uh, my thanks to Scotland's local authorities, whose 2006 Crown Estate Review Group report did so much to prompt this debate, uh, as also did the inquiry of the Treasury, UK Treasury, uh, Treasury Select, the Treasury Committee uh, of the House of Commons and the Scottish Affairs uh, Committee. So in 2014, the Smith Commission eventually recommended that management and revenues be devolved and that management should be further devolved to Scotland's local authorities. Despite UK government guarantees that Smith would be implemented in full, legislative competence for the revenues of the Crown Estate has not been devolved. Presiding officer, this bill is not the bill that Greens would have wished to see. It's predicated on a flawed devolution settlement. It's based on the assumption that the Crown Estate is some kind of coherent suite of assets which by law must be maintained as an estate and land on behalf of the Crown. The Crown Estate is a feudal relic. It's an ad hoc assembly of rights, including everything from gold and silver, a lock-up garage in the new town of Edinburgh and the island of Rockall. Our goal as a parliament should be to sweep away this anachronism and not to perpetuate it within a framework of complicated management and delegation powers. It's also a colonial re relic. Rockall was the last act of colonialism by the UK, preceded on a royal warrant modelled on that used by Captain Cook to steal Australia. Now, amendments to this effect that I lodged at stage two and three were ruled out of scope. Such amendments included the repeal of the Royal Mines Act 1424, the oldest Scottish statute still in force, which reserved natural occurring gold and silver to the Crown and is the origin of their rights and is an act which is perfectly within the competence of this Parliament uh, to repeal. So this debate should remind us that there is unfinished business. We need to legislate, as I hinted earlier in the amendment debate, to modernise the law of the foreshore and the seabed. A report was published by the law Commission, Scottish Law Commission in 2003. It sits on the shelf gathering dust. Had it been enacted, we would now, by now have a Sea, Shore and Inland Waters Scotland Act, which would have enshrined the statutory right to, amongst other things, make sandcastles, beachcomb, and have sunbathe and have picnics on the shore and foreshore. It would have also given crofters the statutory right to gather kelp from the foreshore where the, that was in their crofting lease. It would have put the ownership of the seabed and foreshore on a statutory footing. All of this can yet happen. But nevertheless, for the moment, meanwhile, we will be voting for the modest reforms outlined in the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. And I call Tavi Scott to open from Liberal Democrats. Mr. Thank you Scott, very please. much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Government for bringing this uh, measure forward for, as Andy Whiteman said, for many of us, this is. Uh, what the late John Smith used to call unfinished business. Uh, the reform, I'm with Andy on this, Andy Whiteman on this. Uh, I'm at the uh, radical end of my lot on, on this kind of issue. I'd have abolished them outright, but uh, we didn't get that chance. So uh, reform is uh, reform, and some reform is better than uh, no reform. Uh, so I dug out, and Stuart Stevenson, I'm grateful to him for reminding me of this. I dug out a members' debate from 2007 um, in which a number of people spoke, including mm -hmm. Alistair Allen, Liam MacArthur, Jamie McGregor, Rob Gibson, and was wound up by uh, the then Minister Stuart Stevenson. And in that debate, I I suggested that we might need to rock the boat and Mr Stevenson said as wind up uh, I say to Mr Scott that if necessary we will rock the boat well I suppose on that principle we haven't rocked it far enough but we've done some rocking um, and there the analogy will stop before I uh, uh, before uh, it gets lost in itself or sunk I suppose might be the other way to put it um, there, there are two basic points uh, I want to make uh, about this that the that the Smith Commission uh, uh, process 
uh, did allow people on a cross-party basis uh, to look at areas that we, need to, we knew needed to be addressed. Uh, and in the context of uh, the Crown Estate, again, we could have gone an awful lot further and it would have been, uh, from some of our perspectives, very splendid to have done that. But uh, we did make, uh, again, on that uh, all party, in, in that all-party sense, uh, a real uh, proposal which the government have now uh, begun to give effect to. Of course, there's more to be done uh, when it comes to uh, net process um, I'll be interested to see what the definition of net versus gross is. Um, so no doubt there'll be uh, ongoing discussions with that in how the revenues uh, will, be, uh, will be delivered. But I do want to recognise recognized that uh, at home in Shetland, uh, there is now, or in the process, a pilot, a marine pilot scheme involving Shetlands Council and the Crown Estate Scotland body uh, over the future of Sul and Vaux. That's an area uh, that has not been available to a wide range of marine uses because of the oil and gas industry since uh, the Sulevo Terminal opened uh, back in the... Um formally opened back in the late 1970s. And that's potentially a very exciting development uh, for salmon farming, for mussel farming, for inshore uh, fisheries, um, and in various other areas uh, as well. And that is positive, and we will look to see how it comes with that. I'm also grateful for the measures today on trust ports. I speak with the direct interest of being a former chairman of Lerwick Harbour Trust, as it was then, uh, that I, the, and, the, and the fundamental point about trust ports is, is simply this, that all the, it's the best financial model I can think of in, pub in, public, in the public um, system system today that uh, that it has to be run on a commercial basis but all the monies it makes are reinvested in its facilities and that's a model I would commend to government of any persuasion across a number of areas where they're trying to find um, a financial model that allows um, a proper commercial focus on what needs to happen to, in, to serve the customer in Port's case the people who use keys and need services but in that sense retains the profits into the organization to invest for the future that just seems to me powerful and uh, appropriate. I'm going to make one remark, if I may, on the debate we had on the um on kelp farming today, it just strikes me that uh, regulation is there uh, underneath legislation to allow uh, for uh, an appropriate assessment of any uh, process, whether it's defined as a Joanne um, Laman did earlier on, whether it's d defined as industrial or not industrial. Uh, and I don't think we got that right uh, today. Uh, it's not really appropriate, as John Scott rightly said, to start hauling things back at, at uh, stage three. What should have happened on that? It's a really serious issue. What should have happened on that is it should have been properly assessed at a much earlier stage uh, and, and uh, taken forward in that way. And I hope Parliament reflects on that uh, for the future, because that was not our finest moment today in terms of how to pass primary legislation. Uh, final point is, uh, simply, uh, is simply this. I mentioned uh, Sandra Lawrenson earlier on. She, she said uh, uh, on Friday when she, uh, she retired after 44 years with the Port Authority that, uh, it, that in terms of her advice to people who serve in the future, it's not about attracting the different customers to come and locate themselves in our port because the port is nothing without the customer. Uh, now and again in politics, we should remember a, a useful phrases like that when we're passing this kind of primary legislation. Thank you very much. Uh, the open debate, I can give the open speakers five minutes. So I call Stuart Stevenson, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, indeed, presiding officer. And uh, the cabinet secretary said it's the first time we legislate um, on the Crown Estate, and I'm sure that's true. But it's certainly not the first time we debated, as uh, Tavish Scott's just reminded us on the 1st of November, he held a members' debate. And indeed, in 2012, uh, David Stewart uh, had uh, a members' debate uh, in this parliament on the 18th of April. So, is, and I'm sure there will be other instances. Um, the, the, the one in 2012, I simply have my file because, again, I happen to be the minister who responded to that, uh, that particular uh, debate. So, it's not uh, a subject that we haven't debated before, discussed before, uh, both on the floor and in the, the corridors of Parliament. Um, Andy Whiteman uh, took us back to the 900s. I hadn't realised it went quite far that, that far back. I certainly found the Lords of Auditors of the Exchequer uh, were established as a court in the 1500s uh, to look after uh, what is now uh, the Crown Estate. So it's a very, very long history. Um, the particular things uh, about uh, the, 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 the bill that we are likely to pass in uh, a, a short period of time. One of the ones which has simply not attracted uh, any significant amendment, it was amended a little bit at stage two, is section 11, which is the duty to obtain market value. 
and it basically picks up the existing provision the manager of Scottish Crown Estate must not make any of the following transactions for consideration less than market value, but then goes on to qualify that by saying if the manager is satisfied the relevant transaction is likely to contribute to the promotion or improvement in Scotland of economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being or sustainable development. I think that is a breakthrough provision, frankly, uh, because it recognises that the assets that we are talking about, that we're managing, that we're allowing others to manage here, should be managed for the common good, not simply uh, to deliver an economic asset that flows into the structures uh, of government at all its uh, various uh, levels. So I'm particularly pleased with that particular section uh, of the, the, the bill uh, as, it's, uh, as it's been asked, although we've still got Section 7 duty to maintain and enhance, uh, enhance value. Now, the Crown Estate uh, has a long history. Uh, I've been here a fair while, not as long as quite everybody. Um, John Scott, for example, sitting, looking around the chair, was here before I was, so was Tavish Scott. Uh, but uh, in the earlier days of this parliament, the, I, don't, I don't think we could really say the Crown Estate engaged with members of this place to very useful purpose. I had a long-standing constituency case about uh, persuading the Crown Estate to do something about a harbour at Crivy, and it took something like five or six years before we finally concluded it was actually their responsibility, and then a good deal longer before they actually uh, did anything about it. But I think the Crown Estate, uh, were, if they were anything, they were passively malign or passively neglectful. Um, they were slightly better than uh, other people, if the presiding officer allows me time. John yep. Scott. I have to say, I object to um, your use of the word malign. I've objected to Mr. Whiteman's use of the word malign too in the description of the Crown Estate managers hitherto who were entirely doing their job as they best saw fit and within the confines of the law entirely. And I know many of these people directly and they're men and women of honour and mm -hmm. declaring that interest. But I particularly object to the use of malign in that regard and in their respect. I'm sorry to be awkward about it again. I've already raised this point with Mr. Whiteman and I feel annoyed that it should have to be raised again. Mr. Stevenson. Well, it, it, Mr. Scott's perfectly entitled to make the point that he's just made. I will, however, uh, say that I was pointing at the organisation rather than the individuals with whom I've always had the best of relationships and felt, as Mr. Scott did, that as individuals they were doing the best, but the framework that constrained them did not let them do anything other than, in many instances, uh, act in a way which one could describe as malign. But let's not fall out about a single word. It's simply not uh, worth the hassle. There were private landowners around Scotland who were much, much worse. Uh, we used to go on holiday to Sutherland. The Vestes, who were domiciled in Argentina, never paid a penny of tax in decades, uh, were much more adverse uh, in the way they dealt with things. Now, I realise, uh, presiding officer, I should be uh, bringing things uh, to a conclusion. Uh, let me just say, this is part of returning power uh, to our communities. The David Stewart uh, debate in April 2012, we all talked of Peter Peacock and of transfers uh, that were made under community land Scotland. This is part of a process of restoring to the people of Scotland some of the assets which are rightly theirs and control over them. We haven't completed the journey, but it's a useful and helpful start, presiding officer. Thank you. Call Edward Mountain, followed by Julia Martin, last speaker in the open debate. Ms. Martin. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I begin, I'd like to draw members' attention to my register of interest, in particular to farming. Today's Stage 3 debate on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill is another important step in realising the recommendations of the Smith Commission. And I'd like to just say at this stage that I have listened to some of the comments about the Crown Estate and I've also listened to some of the tenants on the Crown Estate, especially agricultural tenants who seem to be perfectly happy with the way things were run in the past and look forward to a, mo a continuation in the future. And I'm actually quite pleased in that every stage of this bill's passage through this parliament, much of the debate has passed and focused on enabling more local control of assets to local authorities, in other words, devolution. I'm a strong supporter of more local control, 
and I'm pleased that there are provisions in this bill which enable the management of some Crown estate assets to be passed beyond local authorities. What I'm cautious about, though, is too much double devolution, which allows the management of what I believe are national assets to such a local level that the national benefits of the assets could be lost. For example, those who lived in landlocked local authorities, as we've heard this afternoon, such as East Renfrewshire and North and South Lanarkshire, could lose out and should not lose out on the benefits, say, of the management of the Crown estate assets in areas such as the seabed, just because they don't have a coastline. After all, the seabed is an asset that benefits all users, not just the islands and coastal authorities. So I believe we must remember that the Crown Estate assets are national assets, and as such, the Scottish Government has a duty to ensure that the assets and benefit do so to the benefit of Scotland as a whole. I believe that the balanced approach that has been taken with the bill, which with one hand means more local control and with the other hand ensures Scotland's national assets are managed in the national interest, should be welcomed. However, I do have concerns on the potential selling off of assets. The last thing I think we need to see is a complete breakup of the Crown Estate land in Scotland. I believe that if assets are disposed of, the Government should consult with the Parliament and agree with the Parliament how this should be done, something I believe they have singly failed to do in relation to our forests, where they have seen much of the land sold off and not replaced, which was the requirement and the re requisite of the consent that Parliament gave when those forests could be sold. The Scottish Conservatives, therefore, will be watching carefully uh, the Scottish Government and would expect the government to publish its strategic plan and there should be robust guidance including in, included in it to ensure the estate does not become too fragmented. Turning specifically to farming, I would strongly advise this government to consider how best to manage the assets. They must not be fragmented and they must incre increase new tenants and young farmers into Scottish agriculture. There are so many young farmers across Scotland who are desperate for tenancies and the Scot Scottish Government should not let them down by selling off farming assets. They should rather create more opportunities. And I believe the Government needs to learn the lessons from the sale of, of Ockenholrig Oc Farm, a sale which removed rather than created new opportunities for young farmers. Presiding Officer, today I'll be voting in favour of Stage 3 of the Crown Estate Bill as it turns the recommendations of the Smith Smiths Commission into reality. But I would conclude with a note of caution. With the passing of this bill, the Scottish Government is getting control of some very important assets, and I would urge them always to think twice about selling them. Thank you, President. Thank officer. you very much. I call Julia Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, I took over the convenership of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee at the end of deliberations on the Crown Estate Bill and was plunged straight in as the Stage 2 vote was on the agenda. And as we all know, the devolution of the management of funds from the Crown Estate was one positive result of the Smith Commission and provides scope particularly for coastal rural communities to have more say in the benefits from the land in terms of economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being and sustainable development. And I want to commend the committee and the Bill team in particular on how the stage one evidence process was managed through evidence sessions took place, thorough evidence sessions took place with a wide variety of stakeholders and their evidence helped to make the bill stronger. And feedback from the stakeholder advisory group was extremely positive on how the committee and bill team operated. And I echo the cabinet secretary's remarks there. And I also want to thank Graham Day, for, uh, the convener at the time, for steering that course with the assistance of the committee clerks. But at the point at which I took over stewardship of that committee, I want to say one thing in terms of the process on the issue that dominated the day in which the bill passed stage two um, in, in the committee. And of course, that's the harvesting of kelp. And I tried to intervene many times during the debate on that particular amendment. But no member accepted my intervention. So I'm going to use my time to make the points that I would have made um, then. Um, and um, it caused me considerable discomfort at the time as a new convener, as, as well as a member. And I think a lot of people don't realize that committee members were been asked to vote on an issue that had not come up as part of the evidence sessions in the committee stage one deliberations, um, which in essence is purely about the management of the Crown Estate. And it's never a good look for anyone in our responsible position to make a judgment based on no or at best anecdotal evidence. And on that basis, I abstained in that stage two amendment vote. 
And as thorough as that stage one report was, I did a word search for kelp and I found not one result in the report. Now, issues around marine horticulture are not simple things. Nothing in the environmental, the natural environment is, as I'm finding out by stealth. And I had, and I still have, many questions that I would like answered around this issue. Getting hundreds of Twitter messages or 38 degrees emails on the issue shows public engagement and, and passion, but it is no substitute for evidence gathering from scientists and stakeholders who know a subject intimately. I had questions on the methods of harvesting, I had questions on the health and safety, and, and like Joanne Lamont, I had a considerable amount of questions with an importance to the coastal rural economy, and I thought her speech was, was excellent in, in bringing that to the debate. I, I think that all of us should be very careful of ever voting on anything on which we have not had the opportunity to get on the, on the record evidence on. Unintended consequences can only be identified through scrupulous evidence taking. And that's what I think that people, the public expect of us. And Stuart Stevenson is right, and if I can offer him a colloquial term that reflect his, his uh, description of the process that he probably would get away with with the, the, the PO, it would be Hilster Gowdy. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable today in voting for a subject that I'd still not had the opportunity to do a detailed inquiry on, despite my efforts to do post-stage two investigations of my own. Therefore, I'm very, very pleased and relieved that the government is committed to doing its own wide-ranging consultation on the issue. Um, maybe then we can look at a system that protects species and habitats, but does not cut rural Scotland off from the current and future economic, health and social opportunities of sourcing food, medicines, biopolymers and chemicals in the way that other northern countries are involved in, like Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Kelp can be the source of cattle feed that can reduce methane emissions. We're all wanting to look towards something that does that. Biopolymers that can replace plastic packaging that blights our environment currently. And pharmaceuticals that could provide cures or relief to multiple ailments and diseases. And we need to take a rounded, evidence-based approach on this outside of a bill that was not designed to carry this level of detail into a particular area that goes well beyond the area included in the Crown Estate. Now, I did not come to this Parliament to abstain. I can't stand abstaining. It's not in my nature. I came in to listen, question, deliberate and decide. The commitment of this government consultation allows me to come off the uncomfortable position of the fence in the knowledge that we will move forward with all the evidence at our fingertips which is hugely important so that the right decisions are made with no negative unintended consequences to the marine environment, but also for the people who depend on that environment for their well-being, livelihoods and their community's very existence. Because that's, for me, is what the devolution of the management of the Crown Estate is about, presiding officer. Thank you. And I'm not going to ask if that was an unparliamentary phrase. I'm sure to find out at some point. We move to closing speeches. I call on Mark Ruskell to close for the Greens. Three minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I think we've reached a good point with this bill. Um, we haven't rocked the boat to the point of sinking, perhaps as Tavish Scott and Andy Whiteman would like. Um, it has gone some way to delivering the Smith Commission recommendations, uh, not the whole way, but the spirit of the Smith Commission is there, and I look forward to the further devolution of the rewards and responsibilities uh, of the Crown Estate management to democratically elected councils. Um, we've had some debate around sustainable development, and around the important duty that is now in the bill. But I think perhaps too many members, including Mr. Scott, see this as a trade-off, a trade-off between the economy and social objectives and environmental objectives. And that is to misunderstand what sustainable development is about. It's about locking in win-wins for future generations. And perhaps we do need in this, this parliament something like the Future Generations Act, which is in place in Wales, which ensures that that sustainable development thinking runs through every single piece of legislation that we take forward. Um, it's important that as we move forward to develop those economic opportunities that grow from the use of our seabed, that sustainability is right at the, at the heart. And we can't afford to repeat the mistakes of the growth of the salmon farming industry, mistakes that were made during the life of this parliament, but which committees failed uh, to scrutinize, and we just kept making them over and over again, compounding the environmental impact without actually taking the action which is needed. New sectors like industrial kelp harvesting need to be understood fully and planned for. That's why the approach the Cabinet Secretary is taking of a review of this whole sector is important. It will help set the vision, which ultimately will deliver the kind of certainty that businesses need to choose the right path pathway to commercial success. But that will be that will be against a backstop, which is now in this bill, a backstop of sustainability. 
Now, I recently met um, with Gillian Martin, a group of fairies, kelp farmers, who represent a rapidly expanding industry, which, unlike mechanical harvesting of kelp, is scalable. Farm kelp can produce 10 times the level of usable sugars and proteins per hectare than farm soya. And that should give us the sense of the economic opportunity here, but only if we learn the lessons of the past and set the sustainability bar high for industry. Finally, presiding officer, I'd like to pay tribute uh, to the communities whose voices have been heard loud and clear on this particular issue. And I'd also like to pay tribute to SPICE, of course, who have produced briefings and materials for members to read on this particular issue, commissioned by the committee. From primary schools to professors, from divers to David Attenborough, from the shellfish to the whitefish sector, concerns have been raised. We have remarkable people, scientists, who've galvanized their arguments intelligently and articulately. We thank them for that, and there'll be many more discussions government will now need to have with a wide range of interests on this issue. And I look forward to the outcome of those reviews. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell. Now call Alec Rowley to close for Labour. Mr. Rowley, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. I speak today as someone who is no longer a member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, but I would like to place on record how much I enjoyed working with members of that committee on this bill. Uh, and other topics and how much I appreciate the work of the clerks and the, the researchers and all the advice they gave us and the people importantly who gave up their time to provide evidence to the committee as we took the bill through stage one uh, to reach stage three. The cabinet secretary I think has rightly said that this is a historic occasion that is further devolution of powers to Scotland. It's certainly something that I've always believed that where there is a clear case for further powers to be devolved to this parliament in the interest of Scotland, then it's something that we should all be supportive of, of seeing happen. Uh, Andy Whiteman feels that the reforms have been modest. I think that Tavis Scott also, also agreed with, but I would say it's a good start and let's see where, where we go as we understand more the opportunities that will come about by having the devolved Crown Estate. Can I also pick up on a point, presiding officer, um, that, that Tavi Scott uh, spoke about when he mentioned the retirement of the Chief Executive of the Lerwick Port Authority, Sandra Lorison. Um, as, as Mr Scott knows, I've spent many a year up in in Lerwick and, and Bresse, and I know of the good work that, that Sandra has done over all those years, so I would join you in congratulating her uh, on being the first uh, Port Authority Master uh, in, in the country and, and, and wish her success in whatever she, she goes on to next. When we speak about assets of the Crown Estate, it's important to remember the diversity and location of those assets ranging from instantly recognisable buildings and landmarks to farm, farmland, coastline and wilderness environments. Clearly, good management is essential to the effective management of all these areas of the Crown Estate, but it is important that their value is not just seen in the context of commercial gain. I am therefore pleased that the Bill sets out to achieve this and does so by stating that the powers and duties of managers should maintain and seek to advance not just the commercial value of the asset uh, and the income arising from that, but crucially, the manager may do so in a way that contributes to the promotion or improvement of economic development, regeneration, social well-being, environmental well-being, and importantly, sustainable development. I want to speak about, about a couple of those assets. Firstly, in terms of uh, tenant farmers. Um, I, I saw that, that Edward Mountain said that tenant farmers are, are quite happy and we shouldn't look to change anything. In the evidence that, that we took from tenant farmers, it was clear that there is, shall we say, um, a variety of different quality in terms of the actual physical buildings themselves and farms, the houses themselves. And there is a need, I think, to empower farmers more. They were clear they didn't expect the local authority to start running the farm. But there is, there is a need 
to, to look, and I hope that we will be able to look at how farmers have a, a stronger voice, how tenant farmers have a stronger voice, and how they are able to make better representations in order to improve the properties that they are in. I haven't got time, I'm sorry. Um, but I do also take on board the point that, that Edward Mountain made about um, wanting to ensure and encourage more young farmers. I agree entirely with that. On the issue of kelp, uh, I certainly voted for the amendment at stage two because for me it was pretty straightforward that we said that kelp harvesting needed to be sustainable. And why would you not want something to be sustainable. Um, that's why I supported it. I would have to say that I have done much more reading and, 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 and understood a lot more about kelp harvesting since stage two. Um, and I certainly have no regrets in voting for, 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 for the amendment uh, at stage two. Uh, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today to have a further uh, review of of the and, kelp and harvesting and opportunities. So, so again, I would just close Thank by you. saying that, that I think we have done a good deal of work and welcome the, the bill as it will be passed today. Uh, thank you. And before I call Finlay Carson, we'll have a brief pause while we ring the division bell. I didn't want you to try to speak over the division bell, Mr. Carson. Do you want to hear every word you have to say? A call for Finlay Carson to close for the Conservatives, please. I appreciate that, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be speaking in tonight's debate as the Crown Estate Bill uh, nears its final stages of the process, having spoken at stage one and also as a member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, which has heard extensive evidence on the bill. The Scottish Conservatives have always supported the Crown and State Bill in principle and believe that many of the changes made throughout the legislative process will have strengthened the bill for the better. Following on from the Smith Commission recommendations uh, uh, and the Scotland Act 2016 and the devolution of the management of the Crown Estate to the Scottish Parliament, the, the Scottish Crown Estate Bill sets the framework for the long-term management of the Crown Estate in Scotland. And the bill identifies who can become a manager of the Crown Estate asset how its management can be devolved within Scotland and what the remit of the new managers could be. I agree that local authorities, including that island councils, may be well placed to take on the management of assets and recognise that further devolution to local authorities was a significant recommendation of the Smith Commission. However, given the right support, smaller community groups be, may be a more appropriate body and may be able to more successfully take on uh, the management of the assets. I don't believe that there should be any assumption that local authorities should be by default the most suitable organisation and I'm pleased that this will be the case if the bill is passed tonight. I do believe in community empowerment but the idea of the council in my own region of Dumfries and Galloway by default suddenly being responsible for the management of local Crown Estates assets is not exactly one which would fill me with confidence. Now I stressed at stage one that that's my meaning, and I mean it with the greatest respect to Dumfries and Gallery Council, but I've not heard of any great wish for them to take on the asset at Applegarth Estate. Indeed, the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association, while welcoming the devolution of assets, are also firmly of the view that the assets of the four rural assets could be successfully managed by the Scottish Government directly or through a body set up for that specific purpose. And that was the recommendation that was brought forward to the, the Clare Committee and received cross-party support. It's important to strike the right balance in terms of future management of the Crown Estate between local and national level. And we should recognise that a national body may be the best suited to achieve the desirable outcomes. And therefore, in some instances, it's right that national management structures remain in place. But it's important to know which one the government recognise uh, that can potentially be managed at local uh, level and which ones can't. For example, it's only right and sensible that a national body with a Scotland-wide overview is responsible for the management of offshore renewables, energy-related assets and other cable and pipelines. Recognition should be given to the national significance of the seabed and rightly should be managed nationally and the bill will ensure the seabed cannot be sold. However, other assets uh, 
once again, uh, should, and I share the committee view that the bill in some instances should retain provision for devolution to occur where a local authority can demonstrate appropriate expertise and it's considered beneficial from a socio-economic, environmental or sustainable development perspective. With regards to the future sustainability of the Crown Estate Scotland, I believe that it was important to establish and maintain a list of Crown Estate assets and associated liabilities. With this requirement to be included in the face of the bill is it would be important to underpin continuation of the, the access to cross subsidisation. I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has given us assurance that whilst John Scott's amendment was withdrawn, this will still be the case. Kelp. Oh boy, if we didn't know about kelp before, we certainly know about it now, as do lots or millions of people across Scotland. And I sincerely welcome that. However, I have many concerns not exclusively around the environmental pros and cons of commercial harvesting of our natural kelp forests, but more about the appropriateness of the late introduction of the topic of kelp harvesting. Mr Whiteman correctly states points of order or, or provisions to bring forward amendments and so on, and I have no issue with that, but we should probably ask ourselves whether it was the best way to do it and whether it was appropriate in the Crown Estate Bill. I welcome Mark Ruskell's amendment at stage two, but only as a probing amendment to bring forward the serious concerns about commercial kelp harvesting and the potential for environmental damage. But his amendment didn't provide the protection that environmental campaigners might have expected. All kelp is equal, but some kelp is more important than others because the Crown Estate kelp might have been protected through this bill, but what about the thousands of square miles of kelp which will not? I would like to think that this parliament takes decisions regarding environment based on strong peer-reviewed scientific evidence. Now, that in no way undermines or undervalues the information and evidence that both environmental and community groups of the kelp harvest and the, that of the kelp harvesting industry, which was ver very well received through meetings, email and social media. However, there was simply no time to hold a satisfactory consultation and preferably look at the evidence in committee for full scrutiny under the close watch of the public. This is not how I would like to see hugely important issues such as help kelp harvesting dealt with. As my colleague Angus MacDonald said in the Clear Committee, this bill is an enabling bill, it's not for banning anything. However, it is, uh, I really welcome enthusiastically the announcement that a review will be undertaken which could lead to additional commercial opportunities but also protecting our well kelp forests. The cabinet, uh, and in closing, the Cabinet Minister suggested that the licensing regime was robust, but I would argue that the reason we're talking about kelp is that it's not. So I hope I to play my role in the licensing review as a member of the uh, Environmental uh, Climate Change Land Reform Committee. And I'd like to thank my colleagues across the chamber, committee clerks, witnesses and co contributors for getting us to this stage in the bill and look forward to it passing this evening. Thank you very much. And before I call the Cabinet Secretary, again, another short pause for the division bell to ring, please. Thank you very much. I now call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up the debate, please. And can I ask members to show a bit of respect to the Cabinet Secretary? And you may learn things about kelp you didn't know. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful to members across the Chamber Excuse for Excuse me a minute, Cabinet Secretary. Some people weren't listening to that, and I meant it. <laughs> thank you. I'm grateful to members across the Chamber for their usually... Uh, normally helpful and constructive contributions to the debate. I wanted to characterise some of them very briefly um, and not get drawn into some of the detail. I think John Scott gave us a good lesson on process. Claudia Beamish gave us a lesson on sustainable development. Andy Whiteman gave us a lesson on history as ever. And Tavish Scott, as also ever, gave us a lesson on Shetland. Uh, and I think each of those uh, contributions uh, uh, symptomised quite a lot of the contributions that we got uh, throughout uh, today. Uh, but I thank them uh, for the contributions. I thank all members for the contributions as the bill has progressed through Parliament. Now, I said at the beginning of this debate that this is a historic day. We've been debating the first ever bill in the Parliament on the management of the Scottish Crown Estate. The parliamentary process has made improvements to the bill, 
The government has listened. We have accepted a number of recommendations that were made by the Stage 1 report. Uh, discussions have been ongoing uh, right up to the very last possible second on possible improvements to the bill. And I have sought to maintain a consensual approach while also retaining focus on the actual purpose of the bill, which is namely creating pr appropriate processes to change who can manage a Scottish Crown Estate asset and to reform the government's and management framework while maintaining the revenue and capital value of the estate. And the purpose of the bill uh, did look in the last few weeks as if it might be rather lost uh, in uh, the other debate. In my view, the Stage 3 amendments to Section 7.2 are an excellent example of that consensual approach by strengthening the duties to take account of wider issues such as sustainable development, but to do so in a proportionate way. Up till now, the management of the Crown Estate has been governed by the Crown Estate Act 1961, which was expressed in terms of English property law and reflected the dominance of urban commercial property to the revenue of the UK-wide Crown Estate. Well, the balance of the Scottish Crown Estate is, of course, quite different, and there have been since 1961 new industries such as oil, gas extraction, offshore renewables and aquaculture, uh, all of which have an impact uh, and all of which uh, we can see uh, will lead to significant revenue growth in the future. We also have a vision shared across this chamber that in the management of the Scottish Crown Estate, we should strive to add value to the well-being of citizens throughout Scotland's communities, embracing social benefits and sustainable development as well as financial gain. And part of that vision is our pledge to create a framework for further devolving management to the communities of Scotland, creating an opportunity to truly place the accountability of the Scottish Crown Estate in the hands of people across the country. And I make no apology for putting that emphasis on communities. Uh, of the, uh, uh, the various organisations that have uh, stepped forward at this point to show interest in uh, management, uh, three local councils, Orkney, Shetland and Western Isles, but we've also got Port Gordon Harbour, Findhorn Village, Galston Estate, St Abs and I, my voluntary marine reserve, the Tay and Iron Trust, uh, and Loch Goyle Moorings Association. So there is an appetite out there amongst communities, and I think it's important uh, to actually uh, reflect that. Now, the issue of kelp harvesting uh, has, has at times seemed to overwhelm the purpose of this bill, and I'm not going to get dragged back into it at this point in, in the debate. Uh, we are where we are. We may feel that it's not been the most appropriate process to follow, but nevertheless, that's a debate perhaps to be had elsewhere than in the context of this stage three. In closing, uh, the bill has been improved, I think, and strengthened as a result of the parliamentary process. And I'm very grateful to the members of the committee and other members in the chamber today for their contributions. I believe we now have a bill that will help ensure the long-term management and sustainability of these important as uh, assets. And for the first time, there are also new powers in legislation to change the manager of a Scottish Crown Estate asset. I'm pleased to have created a historical first by bringing forward the first bill on the Scottish Crown Estate to this Parliament. We have seized an opportunity to develop a new, modern statutory framework that will support the realisation of our shared national ambition for some of Scotland's most important aspects, assets. Presiding officer, I'm proud to have moved the motion. Thank you very much. And that concludes our Stage 3 debate on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative, legislative consent motion. Could I ask Hamza Youssef to move motion 14825 on the Crime Overseas Production Orders Bill? Moved, President Officer. Thank you very much. And could I also ask the Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef to move motion 14827 on the Offensive Weapons Bill? Moved. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14837 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move that motion? Moved, President. Thank you very so much. And no one wishes to speak in this motion. The question therefore is that motion 14837 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of another two Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 14838 on approval of an SSI and 14839 on the remit of a committee? Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, we turn now to decision time, and the first question this afternoon is that motion 14822, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill, be agreed. Members should cast their votes now.
Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 14822 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is yes, 119. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. The vote is, the vote is unanimous. The motion is therefore agreed and the Scottish Crown Estate Bill is passed. The next question is that motion 14825 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Crime Overseas Production Orders Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14827 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Offensive Weapons Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14838 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14839 in the name of Graham Day on the remit of a committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business in the name of Claire Adamson on pancreatic cancer awareness. And I would just take a few moments while members and ministers change seats. <laughs>